Good morning, Sean. Hello, good morning. Good morning, Mr. Lawyer. Thank you for being here. Good morning. Good morning, Eureka. Good morning, how are you? Great, thanks, and yourself? I'm doing well, thank you. Good. Good morning, Tamara. Hi, good morning. Oh, you can't see me, huh? I cannot, it's a black screen. It looks like your camera might be covered. Oh. Okay, well, that's why I asked my compadre to be on this call. Good morning, Paul. Good morning. Have a great meeting. Thank you. This is the clerk. The meeting is now live on the meeting portal and YouTube. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Rhonda. How are you? Wonderful. And yourself? Very well. Thank you. Great day for a board meeting. Good morning, Sherry. Hi. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a great meeting today. Thank you. Michaela, I'm not sure if you can hear me or not, but um, it doesn't look like your audio connected. Good morning, Neil. Good morning, Michaela. Good morning. Have a good meeting, Neil. Good morning, President Wasserman. Good morning. Was that Rhonda? I was scrambling for my mute. It sure is. Good morning, Rhonda. Have a wonderful meeting today. Thank you. Your clerk today is going to be the wonderful Nancy Guerrero. Nancy Guerrero. Wonderful. Hi, Nancy. Good morning. Good morning. You picked a good one, Nancy. <laughs> yes, I did. I drew the right straw. I got lucky for sure. Yep. I know we haven't started yet. Supervisor Lee, I see you're on just a heads up. I'll be asking you to do the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay, already. Let me practice. <laughs> Thank you, sir. I know you can do it with your eyes closed. <laughs> Thank you. Recording in progress. And it's 9.30. Nancy, I'm looking at my screen. I see Supervisor Chavez and Lee. I know we're not having Supervisor Ellenberg today. 
and I don't yet see Supervisor Sumidian. Do you agree? I agree. There's Supervisor Chavez, number two pencil. When you reached up to the camera, it filled the whole screen. Yes. Good morning, Greta. Good morning, Nanda. Have a great meeting. Thank you. Oh, we will. And for those of you listening in right now, we'll have public comment item under item number six, which is your opportunity to speak about anything not on today's agenda. We just ask that you register electronically in advance so we can manage that properly. We're anticipating the arrival of Supervisor Simidian shortly. We'll give another minute. Recording stopped. All right, I just heard from Supervisor Sumidian. He's restarting his computer and will be joining us in just a minute. Supervisor Sumidian. There we go. All right, let's start. Recording in progress. Thank you very much. Nancy, if you'll please take roll. Supervisor Lee. Good morning, Lee present. Supervisor Chavez. Here. Supervisor Sumidian. Here. Vice President Albert. Absent. And President Wasserman. Here as well. Thank you. Now we're going to item number two, Pledge of Allegiance. If all of you who can stand, please stand. Supervisor Lee will be leading us in today's pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, United States of America, America to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands, one nation, nation under God, God, God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. <laughs> We're going to be a quintet and go on the road. We got to work on it. All right. Number three is our invocation by Tamara. And I'm going to say Moza Juani Alvarado and Gerardo. Oh, I'm not going to make yours right, Gerardo. Gerardo. I'm going to just turn things over to Supervisor Chavez. Thank you. Extend. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, I'm really honored to have both Tamara and Gerardo um, here. They are members of the Cal Poly. Tona Leke, um, and they're going to be our invocators today. 
Um, Tamara serves as a program officer in the David and Lucille Packard Foundation's local grant making program in a new role. It's really very exciting, leading the cultural and civic interests investments, I'm sorry, in the vibrant communities portfolio that spans five Bay Area counties. The portfolio invests over four million annually to advance creative environmental and civic organizations that connect people with art, nature, and their communities, creating a unique sense of place for our entire community. Tamara joined the Packard Foundation after serving as the executive director of the Leo Shortino Family Foundation, a San Jose, California-based foundation that focuses on youth and the arts. She holds a bachelor's degree in Spanish literature with an emphasis in Chicano studies from Stanford University, and she's been a traditional Aztec dancer for over 20 years and is a member of the Tuan Alecui Aztec Drum and Dance. Gerardo Loretta was born um, in Santa Cruz, California to Molly Lucero Munoz and Juan Loretta. Being raised in San Jose, Gerardo has ser been serving in the urban indigenous communities for over 20 years, personally and professionally. Gerardo is the Director of Development and Communications for the Indian Health Center of Santa Clara County, an incredibly important partner to the county. And as a Chicano of the Mescalero Apache Pueblo, Peme, First Nations, Gerardo works to elevate the visibility of the urban indigenous community while celebrating their traditional healing practices on behalf of past, present, and future generations. I'm very honored to welcome Tamara and Gerardo. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having us. Uh, good morning, County Board of Supervisors, President Wasserman, and a special thank you to you, Supervisor Cindy Chavez. Thank you so much uh, for the invitation to be here with you all this morning and in this way. I, I do want to take a moment um, and express our collective gratitude um, on behalf of who we are and those we represent uh, to be able to gather today on the ancestral homelands of the Moekma Ohlone tribe of the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, super grateful that my colleague, friend, and uh, comadre, uh, Tamara Mosawani Alvarado, invited me to participate alongside her this morning. Um, we are going to be leveraging um, a ceremony that we utilize within our Aztec dance tradition, um, honoring the directions, and these directions were set aside to honor uh, certain aspects of our community, both past, present, and also our future. Um, at this time, I'd love to turn it over to my comadre, Moscawani, uh, to, to lead us, to begin leading us in that acknowledgement. Thank you, compadre. I appreciate each one of you that's here on this call. Um, I'm also not trying to be Nesya and not be on the call, literally. I'm calling in from Sheridan, Wyoming. I serve as the chair of the Western State Arts Federation. And apparently, um, just having a little bit of uh, technical difficulties, but anyways, I um, absolute, absolutely wanted to be present, even though I'm, I'm far representing our community um, throughout the Western region and arts and culture. Um, so we will definitely imagine that I'm on this call with you. <laughs> um, and as my compadre said, thank you compadre for backing me up always in community and on the Zoom. All right, so in our first direction, we honor the East. This is direction where the sun rises. I'm moving briefly, so just remember that. This is the east. If we were all together, uh, we would honor by standing up and moving um, in that direction. And now we will honor the western direction, the direction of the women where the sun sets. And in particular, I want to highlight the role of women as caregivers, um, and heads of family and want to honor the women in our community with this direction. Compadre, now I'm handing this back over to you. Um, at this time, I wanna take a moment to honor the Northern direction. Uh, this is the direction that set aside within our tradition for us to remember all of our ancestors, the ancestors uh, that we carry with us in every space um, and in every opportunity at the same time. It gives us uh, a moment to acknowledge the elders within our community. Um, at this time, I'm gonna take a moment to honor the, um, the direction of the South, a direction that's set aside for us to remember the children within our community. At, and, and, and with that, we also get to take a moment to honor the child within each and one of us. Passing it back over to you, comadre. Gracias, compa. 
and now also honoring this is one of my favorite directions they're all awesome but honoring father son um i like to always comment that the sun always gets up and so shall we we get to get up and get that inspiration from the sun that shows up rain or shine um, father back to you yes taking a moment to um uh, focus our attention below us to um, our holy mother earth who continues to give to us each and every day so generously as long as we continue to maintain a healthy relationship and steward her in a good way back to you Coma. Compadre, and this I learned from you and from our other teachers, our maestros and maestras, the direction, the seventh direction is focusing in on ourselves. And this is where we get to honor you, all of you who are on this call, the county supervisors, the staff, all of the frontline workers. This is a direction where we honor the opportunity to take care of ourselves. And so I know that my compadre, not only in his personal, spiritual and professional life, you have taught me a lot about that and certainly the Indian Health Center taking good care of us. And this is where we honor that opportunity to please take that. Take the time to take care of yourself, to drink some water, step outside, breathe the fresh air, put your hands down to Mother Earth and give thanks for yourself and for the opportunity to serve our community. And with that, uh, we appreciate this opportunity. We are, of course, we have many associations but we are so proud to be part of this community, of this county, Santa Clara County, where we represent it everywhere we go. Um, and so we invite you also as members of Calpuli Tonaleke to come to the Day of the Dead ceremony, November 2nd, free and open to the community at the School of Arts and Culture at the Mexican Heritage Plaza. And with that, we conclude our time. Thank you very, very much, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you very, very much, and Tamara and Gerardo. Thank you both very, very much. Thank you. All right, with that, we're gonna move on to item number four, which is an adjournment in memoriam, which I'll read in just a moment, but I will uh, mention this for a second time. Item number six is public comment, which is the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's agenda. We ask that you register electronically now um, if you wish to speak on item number six. So now item number four is um, myself today and to adjourn in memory of Dr. Jeff Robertson, Chief Medical Officer. Dr. Jeff Robertson and Ch Chief Medical Officer at Santa Clara Valley, excuse me, the Chief Medical Officer at the Santa Clara Valley, huh, the Santa Clara Family Health Plan passed away in a tragic accident on Tuesday, September 13th. Dr. Jeff, as he was known to his colleagues, worked at Santa Clara Family Health Plan for 10 years. The first six of those he spent as the plan's chief medical officer, the head clinician overseeing covered Medi-Cal and Medicare services for plan members. Departments under his direction included Utilization management, pharmacy, long term supports and services, case management, behavioral health, quality, and health education. For the last four years, he served as part time medical director overseeing utilization management decisions. Dr. Jeff's past positions included chief medical officer for New York Life, Blue Shield of Washington, and First Choice Health. His clinical practice was in family medicine, including three years with the Peace Corps and Mother Teresa's mission of charity in Kathmandu, Nepal. He often says that Mother Teresa taught him everything he needed to know about managed care, how to distribute limited resources compassionately. Prior to relocating to San Jose, Dr. Jeff lived in Seattle for 30 years, where he served on the boards of the Foundation for Healthcare Quality and the March of Dimes. Dr. Robertson has an undergraduate degree from Rice University and earned his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine, both in Houston, Texas. Dr. Jeff was raised in Mexico City and was fluent in Spanish 
And apart from being a great physician, he was a supportive mentor to many coworkers over many years. He was a great storyteller and often quoted Winston Churchill. He was a recreational pilot and repeat Burning Man attendee from which he recently returned and where he spent his time talking, taking strangers he had just met up in the sky for an aerial view of the metropolis. My apologies for my, my uh, pronunciation enunciation issues this morning to the family. Now, on behalf of the County of Santa Clara, I extend to Dr. Jeff's family, friends, and colleagues, our sincerest condolences. Quite an accomplished professional and individual. Thank you very much. With that, we move on to item number five, commendations and proclamations. Uh, we don't have any from supervisors. We have one in uh, item number 55, which is on consent. We now turn to the aforementioned public comment. And for the third and final time, the opportunity for anyone to speak about anything not on today's agenda. And I've asked that you register electronically. I see that we have six people, seven people that have done so. So Nancy, we're gonna allow each of those speakers two minutes. Okay, thank you. First speaker is Sharon Luca. I am unmuting you, please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Good morning, President Wasserman and supervisors. I'm here today to ask supervisors to address San Martin residents' concerns regarding ordinance and policies not being adhered to. Surrounding neighbors have done their due diligence by calling and reporting situations. What I'm talking about today are just two situations SMNA has been dealing with. The California Retail Code Section 114387 and the Division B11 Control and Noise Vibration. Food vendors established on street corners and in front of businesses and residential properties in front of hyd fire hydrants have no water to wash hands or bathroom facilities. It has been reported to the DEH and permits out of Monterey and still operating. This could be a health risk and even worse, a human trafficking situation. This needs to stop or adherence to the code and follow up to ensure the safety. Noise ordinance. Residents expressing complaints about continued parties for profit every single weekend. Some that offer food for sale, liquor without a license. These are not the occasional party. Loud music get, can be heard all over San Martin. Times this by three homes in the media area doing the same thing. You have traffic situations where it is unsafe and infringing on other people's properties. Neighbors have constantly reported to the sheriff and to code enforcement and even spoke to the neighbors. Some it's been going on for over uh, two years. Supervisors, when you have rules that are not followed, it is opening up for chaos, which is seen in other areas. I'm here today to ask your help in providing code code enforcement assistance working through these situations and either bring to compliance or to stop work order. Next speaker is Bren Perez. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Good morning. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I'm just calling because um, I'm one of the employees that was put on unpaid admin leave due to the vaccination discrimination in the county. And as uh, we look forward to get back to work, the discrimination continues. They still want to treat us different than those who are vaccinated after overwhelming evidence that is there's no difference. Um, I don't know the latest that uh, Jeff Smith has said because he contradicts himself at every single opportunity I hear him. But based on what I heard last, it seemed that masks only protect the wearer. So why are they requiring us to protect to wear masks? I think um, ultimately every individual should be responsible for their own health. And if I'm worried about getting sick, it should be my responsibility to take those measures and protect myself. It shouldn't be his or the county. Um, 
I think it's a great opportunity to look at the personal responsibility and start empowering the citizens of Santa Clara County to protect themselves, take the measures that they need to do for themselves and stop worrying about other people. We can't control what other people will do, but what we can do is protect ourselves, do what we can for ourselves, protect our families and stop infringing into other people's um, rights and their freedoms. So I really hope that um, the discrimination stops for us. We're grateful that we get to go back to work. Um, so, so grateful for our lawyers and God. Ultimately, I always knew it in my heart that God was with us and um, God always wins. So I'm so very grateful for this experience. I really got to know God at a deeper level and thank you for the opportunity to speak. <laughs> Next speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Hi, Blair Beekman here, making my appearance at the uh, County uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. Hi, uh, happy end of September to everyone. I just wanted to remind what's become my uh, regular reminder at this time that uh, I'm a bit concerned that your closed meeting agendas uh, uh, closed session meeting agendas, they don't spell out specifically enough, uh, just giving us a few un uh, choices and understandings of what exactly is on the closed session agenda each each uh, board supervisor's meeting. I, I don't under quite understand why the County of Santa Clara has that sort of practice when most uh, local governments do have some sort of uh, explanation as to what exactly their closed session meetings are about. And that really helps the public understand the process. And it's, an, it's a needed component to the public process that uh, it respects the closed session process, but also gives the public uh, an understanding of what's going on. And you're not doing that. I don't know why that is. I'd like to learn that more. And I will be uh, writing yourselves letters to ask yourselves how to make uh, the closed session process just a little more clear. And that's what I'm trying to understand with life, uh, better uh, community accountability. Good luck in those efforts. And uh, with 30 seconds remaining, I don't know if you've been noticing, but around the state of California, local uh, uh, law enforcement, they're having trouble describing how many ALPRs they're currently using. There's a massive new influx of ALPRs uh, from the federal level. We don't know how to talk about that openly. We need to learn how to do that. And I wanted to bring that out here so you can, be, you can be aware of what can be good practices to share better accountability practices uh, with community. Thank you. Next speaker is Alan Kamara. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. This is Alan Kamara, um, a nurse at Valley Medical ER and uh, one of the board of directors of the Registered Nurses Professional Association. On behalf of our association of nurses, I wanna call in and thank the board of supervisors. Um, we receive a revised policy of the public health order. Um, we've received a notification for labor relation from labor relation that our nurses should be returning back soon. And I know there's a meet and confer with other union that's currently taking place. Um, the initial return was the 26th, but because other unions are meeting with the county, so there's a delay. Um, we don't know when that delay is gonna, we don't know whether we'll receive um, an update this week or not, but um, Supervisor Cindy, thank you. Thank you so, so much. Supervisor Ellenberg, um, I hope you're doing well. We are not seeing you on this call. I hope everything's well with you and your family. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Odoli, thank you. Thank you so much. And President Weissman, um, thank you so much for meeting with us, hearing our concern, and ask the right questions. Um, we sincerely, sincerely appreciate all you all do. Uh, Supervisor Smeden as well. We hope everything is well, and thank you so much. Um, we could not have done this without all your support. Um, we don't take this lightly. We want our nurses to come back to work. Um, our nurses are exhausted and the return of our nurses will help tremendously with staff. And I wanna take this opportunity to call on behalf of our nurses just to thank you all. 
and we hope the community will appreciate our nurses coming back to help them take care of them. So thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Margo Terrell. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Margo, if you can please unmute yourself. And we will come back to him. The next speaker is EVS, the unspoken majority. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hi, can you guys hear me? Yes, yes. we can. Hi, so my name is Ashley. I work in the EVS department at Valley Medical Center. I've been there for about six to seven years now. Um, the EVS department workers right now are currently being mandated to do forced overtime. They're weaponizing it. Um, some people, they will be written up for insubordination. Um, some of the instances that have happened so far is one where a worker told them they can't stay because they have, you know, childcare issues. And they pretty much told her her kids didn't matter. Another one was a housekeeper who um, commutes to Merced was forced to stay based off of um, being weaponized by the policy that they're making and had to spend a night in the hospital. So he worked in the day shift, worked overtime for PM, slept in the hospital on the knock shift and had to work again on his following day shift. Um, there's multiple encounters where workers are being told they have to stay, if not except being written up for insubordination. These workers come in, are staying three days in a row, overtime, mandatory, and they come in looking like they were watching the TV screen for a whole week with no sleep. Um, one housekeeper told me yesterday, she felt like sitting in the middle of her unit, crying on the floor because she was so tired. Um, we need the board to step in and stop the enforcement of this mandatory overtime on the housekeeping department and also making sure that our management is being held accountable for their actions. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Delilah Polito. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute and you have two minutes to speak. Hi, um, thank you for your part in bringing the high risk workers back. I thank God for touching your spirit to move in the right direction. But I, but I do ask, why does the county continue to, dis to discriminate against the unvaccinated workers? Why are the unvaccinated workers having to wear an N N95 mask and continue to test weekly while the, vac while the vaccinated um, get to wear a cloth mask and they don't have to test. I'm able to attend large events without a mask, such as concerts. I'm able to go to the mall without a mask. I'm able to go to the grocery store without a mask, but I can't enter a county building without a mask. Making people masked to enter county buildings, making workers masked to work in the county buildings makes no difference. There's no invisible bubble that protects it. Jeff Smith announced the mask only protects the wearer. Therefore, it's a personal choice. The county has no right to force, force this on us. The longer you continue to treat the unvaccinated differently by making them wear a different mask and making them test weekly while the, un, while the vaccinated don't have, um, don't have to, um, the longer you continue with the discrimination. Please end the discrimination against the unvaccinated. It is taking a toll on us. It is very stressful. Um, yes, I've never experienced this type of discrimination in my life. Thank you. Bye. Next speaker is Christina. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Oh, good morning, Board of Supervisors. My name is Christina. I work at VMCER. Um, just wanted to um, a second what Alan Kamara um, are, was saying. Just wanted to say thank you to all the Board of Supervisors for hearing us out. Um, I know the nurses have not yet returned um, since the other unions are meeting, but we hope that everything gets worked out for SEIU and the other county employees. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you so much um, for allowing our nurses to come back. Just uh, the morale, just hearing that the potential of like having them come back onto the floor, we're just all so happy and um, we need them to, to return. Um, so I just wanna say thank you, thank you, thank you. Really appreciate it. And we're gonna continue working hard. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is off. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. 
Hi, Board of Supervisors, this is Andrew. I'm an ER nurse at Valley Medical Center. And yes, um, want to thank you guys, um, especially Cindy, Supervisor Chavez, Supervisor Allenberg, Supervisor Lee, um, um, for advocating. Um, <clears throat> I think a good thing that has come out of this is it has really reinvigorated um, the RMPA union and union members. Um, and I hope that they have learned that we can uh, unite and speak out and not be retaliated against. Um, that's a big fear um, from hospital administration. People have worked there for 18, 19 years and people are afraid to speak out in fear of retaliation. And that's really not a healthy, healthy um, environment. So I hope that um, that dissolves eventually and there's leadership and administration can realize that they can work with the workers and voices can be heard. Um, as far as the um, aligning with the state, we've asked all along that we align with the state. I get that the state's um, orders have changed recently um, also, but uh, we still wanna push to align with the state. I'm grateful to be going back to work um, and um, aligning with the state would mean uh, getting rid of testing. The California Medical Association, California Department of Health, neither one of them recommend testing unvaxxed um, people at work anymore. Um, so please continue to push to have the county aligned with the state. And once again, we're grateful. And I wanna give a shout out to um, Supervisor Simidian for your questioning with Sarah Cody at last, in the last uh, Board of Supervisors meeting. I thought it was very appropriate. And um, thank you for the in, in, uh, question with her. Next speaker is Marco Torral. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good morning, Board of Supervisors. I would like to thank you all for bringing back all of the employees on administrative leave. I especially want to thank Supervisors Chavez, Ellenberg, and Lee for putting on the pressure on the changes of the health orders. <clears throat> Santa Clara County, um, and on another note, Santa Clara County could have dropped their lawsuit against Calvary Chapel and the embarrassing the position of their public health officer would have been confidential, but, but you didn't, and now it's part of court filing and it's public record. It shows clearly that Dr. Cody relied on a Bangladesh study, which actually shows masks are ineffective, yet she used it for her mask mandate. Everyone can go and read the court transcript. Just type in on your web browser that Sarah Cody deposition transcripts, and you can see it all there. <clears throat> mandates are not laws. Santa Clara County circumvented law, which mandates, which with mandates, coercing employees into getting the shot. I understand now why Santa Clara County did not fire anyone administratively, despite of many employees running out of their sick and vacation hours. They knew they would have a greater lawsuit on their hands. Santa Clara County counted on bullying tactics of mass, mass compliance, having employees take different job assignments or quitting. They were hoping that no one would challenge the violations of federal and state laws. I want to applaud <clears throat> Supervisor Smedian for highly criticizing the matching policy that Dr. Cody continues to obsess over. Supervisor Smedian gets it and knows people are tired and will not comply with any more mandates. And last, um, I would like to ask you to bring back in-person Board of Supervisors meetings. We have the right to face our elected officials and speak to them directly. You've been hiding behind this COVID facade for almost three years. I still, uh, if anything, I thank you for your hard work and I know you have a lot on your shoulders. And thank you. And that concludes our public comment. Thank you very much, Nancy. And thank you to those speakers for their comments today. We now move on to item number seven, which is our consent calendar. Nancy, we have a very brief consent update. Would you please read it? Yes. There is a request from President Wasserman to add item numbers 12, 16, and 18 to the consent calendar. Item number 12 is to approve referral to administration and county council to report to the board by November 1st, 2022, with the recommended path for the board to take action and name the Alamitos Creek Bridge for Kathleen Kitty Monahan. Item number 16 is to receive report relating to implementation of welfare and institutions code section 
5270 hold. Item number 18, district received report relating to funding options for a one-time allocation of 250,000 and ongoing allocation of $10,000 to the Central Fire Protection District regarding an aerial drone fire detection and suppression program. There is a request from administration to hold item number 20 to November 1st, 2022. Item number 20 is to receive report relating to options for providing funding to the network of food-based organizations to stabilize and sustain the provision of food assistance in Santa Clara County. There was a request from County Council to hold item number 21 to October 4th, 2022. Item number 21 is to receive report relating to the County of Santa Clara strengthening and expanding efforts to confiscate guns from people prohibited from possessing them and illegal guns and supporting any defenses of state or federal laws regarding gun possession. There is a request from Supervisor Chavez to hold item numbers 55C, 55D, and 55E to October 4th, 2022. Item number 55C is to adopt commendation for Luk Long Si Kwan Su Duk Buk Kali for significant contributions to enhancing the quality of life for the Vietnamese American community in Santa Clara County. Item number 55 is to adopt commendation for We Bong Diu Hop Sing Huat Hong Duong Buk Kali for significant contributions to enhancing the quality of life for the American community in Santa Clara County. Item number 55E is to adopt commendation for Hoi Nguyen Viet Cong Nguyen for significant contributions to enhancing the quality of life for the Vietnamese American community in Santa Clara County. And that concludes the consent calendar update. Thank you very much, Nancy. I'm gonna to turn to supervisors first, Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you, um, Nancy. Thanks for getting us through that. Um, I wanted to comment on a few items, um, and I apologize, colleagues, I'm going to go backwards in my, my number counting here. Um, item 56 is um, something I would like to hold just till our next meeting, and these are grazing um, contracts, and I, I wanted an opportunity to complete a um, some community outreach. I had folks reach out to me, and I hadn't been able to respond to them, so Colleagues, the staff is on time. This is my request just to be courteous to a constituent. Um, on items, uh, so just until our next meeting, um, on item 40, uh, 40 uh, I'm sorry, 53, this is an item to approve an agreement with JP Morgan Chase Bank for our operational banking services. And I really want to take a moment to thank the finance agency for the work. Our board enact, enacted an equity pledge during COVID, and we've been adamant that banking services RFP should be reissued to include corporate social responsibility as a factor. And as a matter of fact, Supervisor Simidian, I just want to thank you for your leadership on this uh, topic as well. It's been something we've been focused on for a number of years. The staff has done the work to carry out this RFP in collaboration with the business staff from some of the school districts, and they've selected J.P. Morgan. I would like to read into the record the section of the report that addresses corporate responsibility. J.P. Morgan Chase enjoys strong credit ratings and a Community Reinvestment Act rating of outstanding in California. The CRA rating is provided by the Federal Reserve as a measure of how well a bank serves its community and meets its needs. And the bank has pledged to invest over $5 billion from 2020 to 2025 in equity initiatives and $1.5 trillion to combat climate change. Locally in Silicon Valley, the bank has invested in a range of issues from affordable housing to equipping people with relevant workplace skills, um, including grants to Genesee's work and the Housing Trust of Silicon Valley. It's also worth noting that through our advocacy, the employees of the the employees of the 500 employees of the bank's government banking division will be further protected from discrimination, wage theft, and pay equity violations through this contract. This is an example of the county spending public funds with an eye toward both being cost effective and um, being equitable. So thank you to the staff on that. Um, on item 41, this is the latest round of applications to the state's behavioral health CIP for infrastructure funds. And I wanted to call out that this application includes a request for funds to replace the San Jose alcove site. 
Um, I hope that we're awarded the funds because I am anxious to bring back the alcove site to San Jose. I wanted to let my colleagues in the public know that after San Jose alcove closed, the county launched the Downtown Youth Wellness Center. Um, this program is open, and I really want to acknowledge Allen Rock Counseling for providing the services and being so flexible to doing that at our downtown clinic site at the Santa Clara Street location. The hours of operation are Tuesday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 7 and Saturday 9 to 5. And this is a place for activities learning and a place for youth to socialize and just get an opportunity to be themselves. Item 18, which has been put on consent um, by uh, Supervisor Wasserman. This is the um, this is a, a an item that I brought forward um, a bit ago and I think um, I just want to make sure that that our staff will be getting the equipment um, for fire staffing with technology and resources they need to detect fires that and just to make sure that this is prioritized. I look forward to the report in December about the inclusion of the aspects of the referrals for next year's budget. And I am concerned. I just want to make sure that this is coming back in December. If the staff has any other um, take on that, I would like them to speak now or forever hold their piece on that item. Um, and then Sherry on item 16, um, I'm, I'm glad to see the progress being made for our county to exercise the 5270 option as other counties are doing. It should help us stabilize individuals more successfully before discharge. I do wanna point out that we still need to file an act as a conservator for many individuals and that state laws surrounding this process require some updating. So I am interested in the staff making sure that the board understands what those updates are and that we're making that case directly to the state. I think we can all agree that there are individuals in our community and on our streets who would benefit from conservatorship if it were a more useful tool. So I do wanna make sure that, that that comes back to us. And those would be my updates to, um, to the agenda. So Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. I'm gonna ask if um, Parks Director Rocha is on this Zoom. Um, Supervisor Chavez, you said that holding item 56 would not cause an issue between the I did speak, and the county. Yeah, I did speak to staff this morning. Uh, Wonderful. President Wasserman, I, I wanted to make sure about that. Thank you very much. Okay, that clarifies that. Supervisor Lee. Thank you, President Wasserman. Um, first of all, I would like to, um, uh, before I mention the consent items, I would like to wish uh, friends in the Jewish community and Supervisor uh, Ellenberg a happy new year. Rosh Hashanah. Uh, Shana Tova. And uh, first of all, and then the second is I would like to leave item 52 uh, on consent. This item is related to religious services for our uh, those in custody. We know how important these services are uh, to them due to the COVID. These contracts get held up for far too long. And I would like to make sure our sheriff's office continue to do its best to make direct interfaith services to those held in custody a priority as prayers and meditation provides healing, reduces tensions and conflicts, but also improves the safety for everyone in our jail. So that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. And just for clarification, you just said you want to leave 52 on consent. You weren't taking it off. That's correct, yes. Okay, so it's it's going to stay on there. Super. All right, Supervisor Smitty. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Wasserman and colleagues. Uh, since item 52 was just referenced, uh, I too am uh, quite comfortable leaving it on consent, but I did want to offer a comment for staff, which is um, this is a place where we have to be, uh, I think, very mindful of our obligations around uh, church state. And um, I have uh, often observed that it's a, a tough needle to thread when we're asking our, uh, our staff to both respect the First Amendment establishment clause uh, in terms of the rights of folks um, uh, to uh, receive services and uh, go about their business uh, with church state separation uh, clearly established. On the other hand, there is the free exercise portion of the First Amendment that guarantees folks the right to their free uh, exercise uh, of their religion. So just a, uh, a gentle reminder, staff, to please be mindful of both uh, the Establishment Clause and the Free Exercise Clause with respect to 
uh, uh, item 52, and also to ensure that at no point are services uh, to which folks should be entitled um, in any way conditioned uh, on religious affiliation. Uh, that's what I have on that item. Then on item 19, Mr. Chair, uh, I am, this is the Fire Safe Appeals report back uh, in response to the referral that uh, you and I did, Supervisor Wasserman, some months back. I'm happy to put this on uh, consent, but with direction to staff that we'll need a report back to Hewlett in April of 2023, just to make sure that the timelines uh, are in fact uh, reasonable. Uh, this has been a constant struggle, as you know, so I want to make sure we stay on it, even though progress has been tough to come by. So I'm I'm uh, happy to put, I, I'm going to ask that we put 19 on consent with the direction to return to Hewlett for a review, report and review on, in April. Sounds good to me. Thank you, and sir. And I oh, believe, sorry, I was submitting. No, I believe that's uh, all I have. I just want to hustle through my notes. Yes, sir. That's all I have in addition to what's already been said by my colleagues. Thank you. All right. I see all supervisorial hands down or going down. And so I will turn to Nancy to recognize our one speaker. And supervisor submitting, you are finished, correct? I am. Thank you. Thank you. On that Nancy. item, Mr. Chairman. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Nancy. Okay. One minute while we get our timer on the screen. Our First speaker is Gail Osmer. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hi, good morning, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. I'm sorry. Um, I wanted to speak, thank you very much, at uh, public comment, but I, my hand was raised. But anyway, what I want to talk about quickly is about what is going on um, in the San Jose RV camp over there by um, Columbus Park. I know it's a San Jose issue, but it's a county issue also. There's about 50 RVs parked there at the ball field. Myself and another unhoused person got everybody over there and got them set up. A lot of people came in at night. The problem is if they abate these, this camp, they're going all over the county. There's no place for these people to go. Unfortunately, also, a lot of the RVs, they don't have the pink slip. They're not registered. Um, but most of these um, unhoused have been living in them for years. So um, it's something that the county and the city need to come together somehow. Um, and I invite anybody. I would love to have you come over there and talk to the folks. They want to stay there. You know, they can stay there for a couple of years. Um, and we need to work together because I'm scared to death they're going to abate and there's no place. There's no place for any of these RVs to go but back on the street, back in the neighborhoods. And we all know that most folks do not want that. So um, if you want some background on this, whatever, um, I'm, I'm happy to take you over there. Um, we're trying to keep it clean. There are probably too many, I'm sorry, but where else were they going to go? Because the people that were supposed to help them did not help them. And that's another story. But thank you for letting me speak. And um, I look forward to anybody reaching out. Thank you, thank you, Gail. Thank you. The next speaker is Mike Bullen. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Mr. Bullen. Unmute. Do you hear me? Yes. yes. OK. Hi, I'm Mike Bolin. I live at 21600 Almaden Road, San Jose, California. I'm here to thank the Board of Supervisors for, for suggesting to rename the Los Alamitas Bridge in honor of uh, Kitty Monahan. Many, many members in our community are excited about this idea. I'm a lifelong friend and volunteer partner with Kitty Monahan uh, Community Service Work. In the past, you've seen me often at the board with her. Uh, it's a perfect recognition for our community to recognize her leader, volunteer leadership in creating a network of various community agencies by bridging the community's volunteer network uh, to support her goal of lifelong goal of preserving New Almond and Quicksilver County Park 
and the other open space regional areas in our county. I know of no one else who has achieved this. Over the years, she served on the board of, uh, and continued to serve on the board of almost 20, 21 associations that dealt with saving county parks and open spaces. Kitty loved to be the trail builder. Uh, builder. She, she and take lead on projects. She, uh, and, uh, her naming the bridge after Kitty is perfect. She'd be in, in, in honored greatly. In her work, she sets an example for others to follow. It, this makes me think of how I can teach specifically her skills of taking a leadership to help others create 15 new community organizations for young children to follow. She was a teacher. Her creation, her leadership and tenacity that helped organize Santa Clara County Parks Volunteer Committee. To get Thank you, Mike. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Wow, hi, Blair Beekman here. Um, for consent calendar items, I wanted to uh, comment on item 62. Uh, you're going to be doing upgrades to uh, county jails uh, through the uh, American Disabilities Act. And uh, with that program, I, I figured it, it was a good time to, to simply mention that um, I feel that uh, there's certain cameras, uh, a part of the jail system that are exempt from uh, the surveillance and technology ordinance, this could be a time to review uh, that those sort of cameras don't have to be exempt and should be a part of the ordinance program to give people awareness, understanding, and uh, just an overall transparency in the process of uh, what we're doing uh, with technology in our jail systems and uh, in our communities. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Lydia. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Lydia, if you can please unmute yourself. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, we, um, we're still waiting to go back to work. Um, we're supposed to go back Monday, but as usual, the county or the powers that be are um, dragging their feet and playing games, making excuses. And I don't really trust them at this point because we're coming into one year anniversary of not working. <clears throat> the um, county employees that were placed on unpaid leave. And um, I hate calling in. It's so like, it makes me nervous because just uh, having to speak to you guys, it's very, it feels very insecure because because we're dependent on you. Um, so that right there is very intimidating. And um, we're also dependent on pa powers that be that claim that unpaid leave is an accommodation, James Williams. And we're also intimidated because the powers that be, Jeff Smith, have um, have lied and strung us along and strung you along. And it's intimidating because you are, are their em employer. So you uh, it ultimately the buck does stop with you. I thank you for all that you have done and for uncovering all the um, and seeing the obvious that they've been dragging us along and doing us dirty and being and, do, and discriminating against us. So I say thank you for opening your eyes and pushing for us in that manner and continue please to push for us because at this point, I do not trust them. Um, me, myself specifically, I'm retired and I desire to be reinstated and I'm getting <clears throat> the runaround from HR about who to contact. So I'll be keeping you guys posted because <clears throat> I didn't want to retire, but I had no other option. And I had to move out of the Bay Area because it was too expensive. But I know all in all, this will all work out <clears throat> and God will get all the glory. So I just say thank you. Have a good day. Thank you for fighting for us. Know that this is still happening. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much, Nancy. I appreciate that. Suraj Chavez, did you have an additional comment? Thank you. Just very briefly, I wanted to say thank you to Supervisor Simidian, um for honoring Kitty uh, Monahan. That's just such a, it, it's just so appropriate. And just hearing um, her colleague call in and speak just about 
everything she was doing all the time. She was an amazing, amazing woman. And, you know, part of the reason we name things after people is so that their story lives on and their example lives on. And so thank you so much for, for doing that. Yeah, she was absolutely fabulous as a tuxedo wearing Mike called in to mention. Thank you all very much for uh, allowing that to happen. Supervisor Wasserman, excuse the interruption, but I just ask uh, before you call for the roll, um, I just want to confirm, I think after all that, nothing has been pulled from consent, if I uh, heard uh, heard all that right. Correct. We did have the holds that were in Supervisor Chavez's motion, which were 55 C, D, and E. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you wanted to add item number eight to consent, is that correct? No, that's, we're gonna hear that separately next. Okay, Supervisor Chavez, your hand and, is still- And up. item 56 was deferred for two, for um, until our next meeting. 56 deferred to the first meeting in October. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Okay, we've heard from supervisors, we've heard from the public. I'll now look for a motion to get item seven approved in the form we just stated. Do so, I have a motion? Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Seeing no further hands raised for discussion. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. And President Wasserman? Aye as well. Thank you very much. That passes 4-0 um, with Supervisor Ellenberg uh, not available for this meeting. All right, with that, we turn on to item number eight, which is to receive a report from the Department of Planning and Development relating to the Stanford Community Plan update, including studies regarding municipal services, graduate student housing affordability, and child care. We have our Director of Planning and Development, Jacqueline Onciano, here. I see her on my screen, and I assume we have um, Assistant County Executive Sylvia Gallegos, Deputy County Executive Sylvia Gallegos here as well. Jacqueline, there's our Deputy County Executive. Jacqueline, are you kicking it off or Sylvia? Can you hear me is the question because I've yes, been experiencing- I can hear you easily. Great, thank you. Good morning, Chair Wasserman, board members, Jacqueline Anshano, Director of Planning and Development. We are here today to present, uh, do, actually to participate with the board in a study session. We have Sylvia Gallegos, Jeff Bradley with M Group, Brittany Bindex, Lisa McKyle, Charu Aliwalia, and Elizabeth Pianca. We are available for questions after the presentation, which will be delivered by Brittany Bindex, Mrs. Bindex, Ms. Bindex. Good morning, President Wasserman and members of the board. I'm Brittany Bendix, consultant principal planner from M Group. Today's presentation is an overview of the recommended updates to the Stanford Community Plan, including a summary of informational studies that have facilitated facilitated these updates. Our goal today is to introduce this information to the board and receive initial feedback as we are currently working to refine these recommendations. The information you're receiving today is quite voluminous, so before we get started, uh, we do want to acknowledge that we have scheduled a second study session with the board on October 18th to provide for deeper discussion of any recommendations. Our agenda for today's presentation includes a brief background of the structure of the Stanford Community Plan, including a recap of the 1985 land use policy agreement and findings from informational studies that have gone into the policy recommendations. We will provide a focused overview of the draft housing and circulation policies, and then finally address other general recommended policy updates to the community plan that are included in various other chapters. The presentation is just over 20 minutes long, and we will take a moment to pause after each chapter topic to, uh, to request if the board would like to ask questions or provide comments at that time. To start with some context, this is a map of the Stanford land grant lands area. Uh, the community plan and all of the policies we will be discussing specifically focus on Stanford lands within the unincorporated area of the county. That area is shown here in green and we'll refer to it as the Stanford community plan area. 
The other colors provide context for the neighboring jurisdictions that also contain Stamford lands. Starting in the center, the light blue is unincorporated San Mateo County. Just north of that in orange is reflecting the city of Menlo Park. The yellow areas further north, east, and south are the city of Palo Alto. And immediately to the west in the darker blue is the town of Portola Valley. And then even further west at the leftmost side of the map, the area in pink is the town of Woodside. Before we proceed, I'll quickly go over some background information related to Stanford. Uh, in 1985, the County of Santa Clara, the City of Palo Alto, and Stanford University entered into a land use agreement. The agreement, which is still in effect, has the specific purpose of establishing mutual policies regarding land use, annexation, development of Stanford lands in unincorporated Santa Clara County, and community services. Additionally, the agreement states that Stanford intends to continue to provide all municipal services to its academic facilities in the unincorporated area of Santa Clara County. As we move forward in our discussion today, it's important to keep in mind that the scope of academic uses within the Stanford lands, uh, as they include not just instruction, research, and administration facilities, but also housing. The Stanford Community Plan, or SCP, is a land use planning document originally adopted in 2000 that guides the growth and development of the SCP area. It works in coordination with the 1985 Land Use Policy Agreement, and it supplements the county's general plan with specific goals and objectives to that area. The SCP focuses on two major principles, compact and efficient urban development and conservation of natural resources. The SCP also includes a housing linkage policy, which serves as the primary mechanism for regulating and mitigating development within the plan area. The housing linkage policy requires that housing be concurrent with or prior to academic development. Therefore, this policy mitigates housing impacts of anticipated development, which also helps uh, mitigate transportation impacts. Similar to the general plan, the SCP contains seven chapters that contain different land use topics. This includes growth and development, land use, housing, circulation, open space, resource conservation, and health and safety. And as I previously mentioned, today's focus is on housing and circulation with a general overview of key changes to the other chapters. Each chapter includes a summary and background section, key strategies, policies, and implementation measures. Together, these elements work to provide coordinated focus on the goals, approach, and action for each chapter topic and include an analysis of why each element is necessary. As a whole, the SCP provides policy guidance for the review of general use permit applications that Stanford may submit to the county when the university requests further development of the campus. In November 2016, Stanford University submitted a general use permit application, which included a request to update the 2000 community plan. This process is generally referred to as the 2018 General Use Permit or GUP review. The GUP application uh, was ultimately withdrawn by Stanford in November 2019. However, given the progress made by county staff on both the GUP application and the community plan update, at a Board of Supervisors meeting in February 2020, the board directed county staff to continue its process to update the Stanford community plan as part of an update to this countywide general plan. This direction also included a request for further analysis regarding Stanford's activities relative to the provision of municipal services, graduate student housing affordability, and childcare. The resulting studies were shared with the community in April and May of this year, and I'll go over each of these studies in the following three slides. 
The municipal services study was provide uh, was prepared by management partners with the purpose of understanding the adequacy of the services provided by Stanford University. The study compares Stanford effort to services to provide services to the city of Palo Alto and another private large university, the University of Southern California or USC, across 26 different service areas ranging from animal control to water supply and conservation. Ultimately, the municipal services study found that across all of the municipal services examined, the services provided are generally equivalent to those provided by cities. However, transparency of service delivery needs improvement as to enable Stanford community residents and County of Santa Clara officials to understand, measure, and evaluate such services. Similarly, fiscal transparency and public accountability is limited and needs improvement. And with this in mind, the study found that a framework to document services is needed. And where warranted, the study encourages the County of Santa Clara, Stanford University, and the City of Palo Alto, as well as other affected jurisdictions to collaborate by identifying voluntary funding mechanisms for any municipal or public school services. The Graduate Student Housing Affordability Study was prepared by Kaiser Marston and Associates with the goal to determine if there is evidence of housing affordability challenges for a share of Stanford graduate students. This study supplements the 2018 Affordable Housing Nexus Study that was prepared for the 2018 GEP application. The study found that Stanford provides housing for approximately 75% of its graduate students, both on and, on, both on and off campus, and that the existing units approximately meet the existing demand. Additionally, of those available housing units, 85% are available to households at low or moderate income levels. However, the study also indicated that despite the availability of housing, students still had difficulties with the cost of living in the area. For example, the study pointed to Stanford's 2021 student survey on university life, in which 16% of graduate students indicated that they experienced frequent financial challenges and or food insecurity. The study also indicated that affordability challenges appear most prevalent among international students, driven in part by visa restrictions on spouses' ability to work and by a lack of access to federal student loans. Finally, the study found that families also face financial difficulties with 14% of graduate students with children having an estimated gap in financial resources, triple that of graduate students without children. And that's after consideration of gap funding sources, such as Stanford's Graduate Family Grant, which provides up to $20,000 to qualifying students. The third and final study I'll cover is the child care study prepared by Public Consulting Group. The child care study was designed to use both quantitative and qualitative research to learn more about the needs and suitability of Stanford's current child care offerings. It also provided a comparison to a group of public and private peer institutions throughout the country. For this purpose, peer institutions refers to services that are doctoral universities with high levels of research, offer on-campus child care services, and have campuses located in regions with similar costs of living. The study had four key findings. First, that Stanford's on-campus childcare centers appear to offer similar levels of service and costs to that offered at peer, peer institutions. Second, that the university offers more childcare programs and slots per potential use than its peers, even though there is a reported unmet need. Third, that Stanford's reported costs for on-campus childcare remains higher than the reported average childcare costs incurred by students, faculty, and staff for on and off-campus childcare combined. And four, that the majority of Stanford graduate students, faculty, and staff ranked providing more substantial childcare subsidies as the most preferred form of additional childcare benefit, regardless of that benefit, whether that benefit would be applied to on or off campus childcare facilities. 
With that, we'll now turn to policy recommendations in the SCP update, beginning with the housing chapter. The housing chapter in the 2000 SCP characterized the context for current housing trends. And as you'll see on this slide, the trends have not changed over the past 20 years and may have in fact increased. These key trends include affordable housing as a regional crisis of significant concern and great importance. The regional housing needs allocation or arena for this upcoming housing element is approximately 3,100 units of which 58% must be below market rate. There continues also to be an ongoing jobs and housing imbalance increasing the county um, with that has increased in the county from 1.36 jobs per housing unit in 2010 to 1.47 jobs per housing unit in 2021. There is also continued market competitiveness for both market and affordable housing, and there is a growing commute distance for Stanford affiliates. The chart on the right of the slide shows the commute distribution of Stanford faculty, staff, and postdocs between 2000 and 2020. Faculty and staff are shown here in orange and postdocs are shown in blue. While many individuals appear to live near campus, a, sub, a substantial amount of a substantial amount are commuting from San Jose, San Francisco, Alameda, and Contra Costa counties, and even beyond. Asserting the urgency of the housing crisis that has continued since the 2000 SCP update was a significant update to the narrative portion of the housing chapter. As we considered the efficiency of the current SCP, we also looked at the pace of on-campus housing production. Since adoption of the 2000 SCP, there have only been 60 new faculty and staff housing units and 4,400 new student beds built on campus. There has also been 1,023 new faculty and staff units built on other Stanford land grant properties in Menlo Park and Palo Alto. Although please note that the 1,023 number on this slide does not include Stanford's recent purchase of approximately 750 units in the Oak Hill apartment complex on Sand Hill Road. However, this amount of housing has not met the demand for Stanford affiliates and is considered a major force behind the trends and context we shared on the previous slide. Again, I wanna stress that the trends mentioned are not new since 2000. And we can see that in the existing housing chapter strategies, which, re which require no changes, just enhancement in their supporting policy and implementation measures. These strategies are as follows. One, increase the supply and affordability of housing. One A, plan for an adequate and balanced housing supply. One B, Facilitate and expedite needed residential development. 1C, augment affordability programs and funding. And number two, ensure compatibility of new housing with existing neighborhoods. So before we move into the policies and implementation measures, one major change to note throughout the housing chapter is that the updates expand the population being housed to include staff, postgraduate fellows and other workers. Initially, housing requirements reference students and faculty. These references are now updated to reflect the broader population at Stanford University to read as undergraduate students, graduate students, faculty, staff, postgraduate fellows and other and other workers. In the next two slides, we will summarize the policy and implementation measures provided in the draft housing chapter. We will also indicate how the policy or implementation measure issue relates to the existing 2000 SCP or how it may differ from the recommended conditions of approval during the county's consideration of Stanford's 2018 GAP application before it was withdrawn. This is the case with the first policy that we have listed here fully mitigating the housing demand for both affordable and market rate housing that results from future campus development. This is accomplished by requiring Stanford to provide all of the new housing as documented by a linkage policy nexus study. The concept of a nexus study was introduced during the 2018 GAP application process and will be a recommendation that carries forward in this SCP update. 
The remaining housing policy and implementation issues are all new concepts. These include responding to site acquisition concerns from, from surrounding cities that stress that university owned housing removes taxable units from their own local markets. This is addressed by requiring construction of required affordable and market rate housing on campus or on contiguous Stanford lands in Palo Alto. The added policies are also, or the added policies also require construction of affordable housing instead of in lieu payments, as the affordable housing fee does not keep pace with the rise of construction costs. And finally, additional policies and measures are included to encourage affordable housing beyond what's, what's required. The following are also new policies and implementation measures included in the SCP update. A streamlined approval process for housing located near transit, ministerial approval for designated housing opportunity sites in the housing element, encouragement for deeper financial assistance for housing, expansion of on-campus housing eligibility for Stanford affiliates, and encouraging Stanford to align with state law and allow for the development of ADUs on their property. As we have already reported on these recommendations, we do have some general feedback from Stanford as well as from the Housing, Land Use, Economic and Transportation Committee of the Board or Hewlett. Stanford has asked the county to consider the following. Provide greater flexibility with the location of required housing, especially, especially affordable housing. And similarly, provide greater flexibility on how affordable housing obligations are met. Provide objective design standards beyond the housing opportunity sites to facilitate streamlined housing development. And provide a mechanism for a housing credit, where if Stanford constructs housing now, it could be prorated toward a future toward future housing that would be required by a future Nexus study. And just to reiterate, this is feedback from Stanford, who is here today and available to expand on these concerns or answer any questions from the board. The feedback from Hewlett has been direct. Stanford must mitigate future growth by providing housing on the Stanford land grant lands, including the campus and contiguous parcels within the city of Palo Alto. Hewlett also acknowledged the request for greater flexibility in the location of housing. However, the committee stressed that this flexibility must be consistent with the goals of the SCP, with special attention to the goal of full mitigation. Based on that standard, the committee did not recommend a housing credit. So at this point, we're roughly halfway through the presentation. At the pleasure of the board, we can pause for questions on the housing topics, or we can proceed with the next topic, which is circulation. Hi, Brittany. I'd, I'd like you to go through the presentation in its entirety, and then we'll turn to the public and the board. Okay. Next slide, please. The second chapter we'll cover today is circulation. On Stanford land alone, there are approximately 72,000 jobs and students. Nearby downtown Palo Alto also has thousands of jobs and residents. And so one issue that is immediately apparent is that any transportation policy to curb congestion would take a system-wide approach. What we emphasized in the context added to the circulation chapter is that the Stanford University campus is a unique setting with an extraordinary opportunity to meet common challenges to congestion management through innovative solutions. This special attribute of the university is credited to the proximity of interrelated values, such as land use, density, and transit accessibility. As a result, the Stanford campus setting creates unique opportunities for coordinated problem solving across the area for walking, biking, and transit use. And together, these ultimately provide an opportunity to alleviate local congestion and reduce dependence on single occupant automobiles allowing for greater access and mobility. We also have support with the existing three strategies in the circulation chapter, which require no changes because of their success over the past 20 years in encouraging Stanford to provide innovative solutions to reduce congestion. These strategies include, number one, avoid worsening of traffic congestion through land use and transportation demand management. Number two, alleviate local congestion 
And number three, alleviate local congestion during special events. These next two slides provide a summary of changes to key policies and implementation measures in the circulation chapter. And again, we will also indicate how the policy may compare with the 2000 SCP or recommended conditions of approval during the review of the 2018 gap. The first issue expands the existing no net new commute trips SCP policy to include the reverse commute direction and monitor during the morning and evening peak hours as well as the three hour peak periods. This was a concept first raised during the 2018 GAP application process and has continued to become a recommendation in the SCP update. We've also included completely new recommendations such as reducing ve vehicle miles traveled or VMT and broadening access to transportation demand or TDM programs for Stanford affiliates encouraging trip reductions by aligning the circulation and housing chapters, and including language to encourage public circulation across, uh, public circulation access across the, the campus. Finally, while allowing trip credits is a continuation of efforts in the 2000 SCP, the updated SCP does include a proposal to expand the trip credit area. Continuing on to the second half of policy and implementation issues, the following proposed changes in the SCP update reflect former recommendations during the 2018 GEP review. These include requiring enhancements to safe and efficient pedestrian and bicycle access across the campus into designated school sites, providing additional clarity for the advanced public notification of special events, and requiring the preparation of a special event management plan. Holding the approval of additional development permits if Stanford has not fully complied with specific SCP performance standards is also a carryover from the 2018 GAP application review. However, this recommendation would replace a previous policy that allowed Stanford to provide alternative compliance through intersection improvements. Finally, of the chapter updates listed here, the provision of centralized locations for deliveries is a new recommendation. The primary feedback from Stanford relative to the circulation policy updates is concerned that the no net new commute trip standard will remain and that a new reverse commute trip standard will be introduced. Stanford sees this as contradictory to the current shift of the planning profession towards a vehicle miles traveled approach, especially as it relates to mitigating project impacts. In response to these current Hewlett, uh, in response to these concerns, Hewlett urged staff to retain the no net new commute trip standard as it's a longstanding and successful program important to residents of the surrounding communities and campus. However, the, commu the committee did indicate an openness to flexibility with the reverse trip standard. I'd like to conclude the discussion on circulation by summary, summarizing how the updates to housing and circulation chapters are designed to work collaboratively to increase housing supply while decreasing congestion. Increasing the housing supply is supported by locating housing on and near campus, providing supportive services near housing, and requiring area-wide pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure improvements. Decreasing congestion is supported through the application of VMT standards, which encourage the strategic location of land uses to alleviate congestion locally. Additionally, enhancing the assessment of both reverse commute trips and commute trips during expanded periods of the day improves the management of congestion at a more regional scale while facilitating additional on-campus housing. Next slide, please. We'll now move on to other policy updates before concluding our presentation. The following is a list of additional updates recommended by staff that extend beyond the updates to the housing and circulation chapters. Limiting future GUP approvals to 10 years maximum, relocation of the potential future public school site, extending the academic growth boundary to 99 years, Subject to a four-fifths vote by the Board of Supervisors, we did 
We did hear a lot about this during the 2018 GEP application process. New campus design guidelines, incorporating the county health element, and finally, incorporating recommendations from the municipal services, graduate student housing affordability, and child care studies. At this time, the key feedback we've received from Stanford on these other policy topics focuses on three points. First, concerns relative to the extension of the AGV for 99 years. Stanford has put forward concerns that California's own Office of Planning and Research recommends a 20-year planning horizon, which is a shorter time period than the proposed 99 years. Second, Stanford raised concerns that the SCP updates financially obligate the university to fund municipal services, a requirement Stanford does not believe has legal standing. And similarly, the third concern relates to any financial obligations Stanford would have to the Palo Alto Unified School District. The university has expressed that this would be in com conflict with the state's constitution. In response to these concerns, Hewlett indicated a desire to retain the proposal to extend the AGB for 99 years, noting that the policy includes a mechanism to allow development should a future board find it necessary during that time frame. Relative to the financial obligations, staff would like to indicate that the SEP will not require payments, but rather encourages voluntary payments in lieu of taxes recommended by the Municipal Services Study. Next slide, please. Thank you for your attention. Uh, we know that this has been a lot of information. As we mentioned at the very beginning of this presentation, the purpose of today is to introduce you to the proposed updates and acknowledge some of the initial feedback received. The next public meeting on this subject is the second study session with the board on October 18th, at which time we can have a deeper discussion on any of the issues or concerns raised today and provide an update in our ongoing conversations with Stanford. After this study session and the next, we will re further refine the chapters and then proceed with the final review and consideration process of SCP updates later this fall with the anticipation of board consideration in December 2022. Thanks. That concludes our presentation. Thank you for your attention this morning. Our team is available for any further questions or comments. Thank you, Brittany Bendix and team. Uh, with that, board members, I'm going to turn to the public to hear from them first. Nancy, if you'll allow each of them, please, to speak for up to two minutes. Okay, one moment while we get the timer on the screen. For speakers, Tim McKenzie, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hi, my name is Tim McKenzie. I am an academic worker at Stanford, have been for nearly a decade as both a graduate student and now as a postdoctoral researcher. Um, I'd like to call out specifically the affordable housing policy implementation and the, the, how the graduate housing affordable study said that housing is affordable to people at low to moderate income. However, graduate students are solidly in the very low income category. As a postdoc uh, with no dependents, I am below 60% area median income, have a PhD working at Stanford and still in low income. So I'd like to ask that all affordable housing that's included in the Stanford community plan, that the definition of it means affordable to the housing, uh, uh, to the population that has access to housing. It's not good enough to look at local uh, cost of living, but looking at the actual salary that the people receive. Um, and I'd, I would like to uh, second the board's recommendation or Hewlett's recommendation to not count housing built now for future GUP updates. Uh, the recent Oak Creek announcement where postdocs are going to have pr priority only came after a Stanford Daily article earlier in this month, month which told stories of uh, there was a postdoc who lived in the woods for a few, a few weeks while trying to find housing. Um, the housing situation is absurd. Uh, uh, it's really crazy. And I, I'd like to ask that the policy specifically be that anyone who is both employed by Stanford and living in Stanford housing, that affordable housing 
is provided them and that meaning no more than 30 percent of income um, and really wanted to highlight that and make sure that the housing is affordable to people who can access it thank you much next peter uh, next speaker is peter dreckmeyer peter i'm unmuting you please accept the unmute you have two minutes to speak thank you good morning this is peter dreckmeyer i live in palo alto and in the late 90s early 2000s I was director of a group called the Stanford Open Space Alliance and was very involved in the community plan then. Uh, since then, I've served on the Palo Alto City Council, and I'm currently serving on the Stanford Community Resources Group. And I just want to say, um, I think staff and consultants have done a great job on this, these studies and the report, and also that uh, what came out of the last community plan and is likely to come out of this will really benefit Stanford University. You know, it, it encouraged smarter planning, uh, accessible housing, um, attracts more faculty, staff, other employees, and students, and amenities like childcare or better circulation improve quality of life. So um, these are all really good things for Stanford. I want to comment on the open space issue. I think it should be permanent open space in the foothills. And the reason is other developers have a floor area ratio. There's a maximum amount of development rights they get. And after that, there would have to be some exceptions made. Um, Stanford does not have that. And st the Stanford campus is already very, very dense, which it's better to have all that development there than in the foothills. But we really should think of it as a transfer of development rights or something comparable that in exchange for this high density, the foothills should be permanent open space. Um, and I just want to say that, you know, Stanford is going to complain and subtly uh, threaten lawsuits, but they are not entitled to any more development. And if they want to say, we're not going to go with these things, we'll sue you. The county can just say, okay, well, you know, you're maxed out. A lot of us in the surrounding communities feel like Stanford has had plenty of development over the years. So you've got an upper hand on that. Hold on to it. Thank you. Next speaker is Aaron Efner. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Thank you so much. Good morning, President Wasserman and members of the board. My name is Aaron Efner. I am with Stanford's Land Use and Environmental Planning Group. I have a very brief statement just acknowledging that we uh, sent a letter in yesterday. Our letter has an overview of our position on the uh, comprehensive or community plan update. We're not making any further statements today, but we're, uh, as Brittany mentioned, here to answer questions should any come up that require um, our input. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Blair Beekman. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Thank you. Uh, hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, I guess, you know, this is an item that's come to yourselves uh, quite often over the past few years. I've tried to offer help and advice in the areas of uh, looking to uh, UC Davis, UC Irvine, uh, and I guess uh, UCLA area uh, as ways to uh, kind of study uh, land use issues around campuses. Uh, good luck on, in, in this sort of effort and, and uh, choices you have available for yourselves. Um, I, in all your planning at this time, uh, there is a, a portion, a component of this process that uh, I think has to be better considered and that's the future of law enforcement. And what is what is the role of Stanford campus police that uh, it's not being talked about that I, I think there's a really hardy contingent uh, within Stanford that that wants to talk about this issue and does try to with yourselves. You know, we have a whole future of reimagined to be considering uh, good luck in those efforts, what you could be doing uh, with with the law enforcement questions in the future of planning. And finally, uh, the first speaker that you had, uh, Tim uh, was his name, he offered really nice words. I was really uh, invigorated by his words. Uh, I think you really have to consider planning issues so much more than, uh, you know, we kind of cemented ideas by the, by the 90s of how we plan our, our future of housing. And, and the first speaker really brought out there's so much more questions to be asked and, and addressed, needed to address for very low and extremely low housing that we just don't know how to do very well. And that was asked for today. 
and that I really hope you make the effort, not just here at Stanford uh, with Stanford issues, but you know, just in overall general, we have you have to have, take a different view of how we consider the future of planning for housing. Thank you. The next speaker is Forrest. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Thank you, Honorable President and Board of Supervisors. My name is Dr. Forrest Peterson. Today I speak as a Stanford employee. I'm a staff research affiliate, and I speak for the Stanford Student Parent Alliance. That is a diverse alliance of undergrad and graduate students, postdocs, staff, and faculty. The county studies found that what you have heard campus parents saying all along. It is now known with certainty that, as your study states, 14% of graduate students with children have an estimated gap in resources to meet living expenses, triple that of graduate students without children. This estimate is after consideration of gap funding sources, including Stanford's Graduate Family Grant Program, which provides up to $20,000 to qualifying graduate students with children, but is not estimated to be sufficient on its own to address the affordability challenges of eligible families. Why is this important? A woman in academia is likely to be forced out due to child and career conflicts and the child care cost pressure. Waiting for a later academic career is not an option as shown by several studies. We need more women from blue collar backgrounds in the tenure track academy. Those like Stanford alumna, Professor Sarde Bania at University of Pennsylvania, the number one school of education, the daughter of a district council 16 painter who benefited from parents that earn union wages and raised a child during her doctoral work. For every success, I've seen many colleagues that simply left. I'm speaking today, not just for myself, but also for my many staff colleagues that could not call in today and ask me to speak on their behalf as well. Thank you. Next speaker is Vivi Kanandan. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Uh, hello. Yes. Uh, yeah, hello, uh, Board of Supervisors. Uh, I want to thank you all for your work. Uh, I'm also a postdoc at uh, Stanford. Uh, so even though I, I work for one of the premier institutes in the world and I have a PhD and have uh, more than 10 years of experience uh, with research, with the low salary that's paid by the university for postdocs the <clears throat> and the high cost of living in the area, it's very hard to uh, find affordable housing and childcare and also many of us experience food insecurity because of this. So I request the supervisors to consider the affordability of housing, childcare for all trainees uh, in your uh, land use agreement decisions. Uh, I and I request you to in include uh, obligations for Stanford to provide on campus or near campus affordable housing and childcare for all trainees and staff. Uh, thank you. Next speaker is Zira Yildering. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hi, um, I'm also a Stanford postdoc, and I would like to talk all the border and the postdocs who already said everything we wanted to say today. And I just want to add that uh, we definitely do not have uh, the housing opportunity. It's not affordable for the postdocs as we need. I know the 2.5, the housing should be 2.5 uh, less than uh, our salary. And the rent I'm paying as of now is more than half of my salary. And I have a dependent here. And beside the housing, we cannot even consider having a child because we cannot even afford our housing yet. And there is no way we can consider having a family here with this standards. So I request all of you to please reconsider the housing and the child care support for all the Stanford postdocs and grad students. Thank you so much. Next speaker is Green Foothills. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, President Supervisors. Alice Kaufman, Policy and Advocacy Director for Green Foothills. We submitted a comment letter that I, I'm not going to go through all the points there. Don't know to take up too much time, but I do want to call your attention to the fairly minor wording suggestions uh, to the academic growth boundary section that were suggested um, uh, by uh, Planning Commissioner Vicki Moore during the Planning Commission meeting and um, that we proposed during our comments during that meeting. That's all contained in the letter and I won't go through it. Um, 
thank you for your consideration and um, thank you. Thank you, Alice. Next speaker is Sabine. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have one minute to speak. The timer will start when you begin speaking. Hello, I'm also a postdoc at Stanford now for three years. Um, I also would emphasize that the situation for um, postdocs and graduate students, it's not great at Stanford with housing. For example, me, I had to move during the pandemic four times within just one year, and this was extremely exhausting and also not very productive for work. Um, and also I'm in biology and biology postdocs go easily up to 10 years. Um, at one point you're considered a staff, but salary doesn't really go up and it's really difficult. Um, I cannot even consider having a family like this. Thank you for doing something for us. Thank you. That concludes public comment. Thank you very much, Nancy. With that, I'm gonna to turn to Supervisor Simidian and then Supervisor Chavez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I, um, I have initially just a question for staff and the consultant. And um, then uh, if I may, would like to uh, hold my comments until after I've heard from colleagues so I can make sure that anything I offer is responsive to comments or questions they've made. My question for staff and the consultants is um, just, I wanted to get a little more clarity about uh, the expectation on October 18th. What is it you all are planning to bring or seek over and above the conversation today? Understanding that that is a, essentially a second study session on this topic. Jacqueline. Yes, Bradley, Mr. Bradley, would you speak to that? Hello, Supervisors, Jeff Bradley with M Group, Project Manager for the County. Um, thank you for your question, uh, Supervisor Smithian. We're really looking um, for feedback uh, today that we can use to revise, refine, um, update policies uh, based on, on consensus or uh, direction from, from the board to your, for the next study session on the 18th. Got it. So the, through the chair, if I may, your hope and expectation is that by virtue of the input we provide today, you'll bring a yet more refined document to us or set of documents to us on the 18th, uh, prior to the eventual action by our board. Is that the expectation? Mr. Bradley? <clears throat> yes, sir. All right. No, I think that's a very good iterative process, um, Mr. Mr. Chair and uh, M Group and staff. And um, other than to say, I'm generally uh, very pleased with the staff recommendations, and I think it's uh, you know generated uh, letters to us all from uh, the cities of Palo Alto, Mountain View, Atherton, Redwood City, and uh, our counterparts in San Mateo County, also in support of the staff recommendation. As I say, Mr. Chair, I'll hold my remarks until after hearing from colleagues. Thank you, Subhas Chavez. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the pretty exhaustive report. And um, and I, I just had some broad questions. Um, one of them is if we could just um, focus on housing for a moment. Um, I am very interested in the issue of how how housing is um, accounted for. And this speaks to two different issues. One is if a if a properties are purchased, taken off the market. So there's a housing development that's been in existence and the university um, buys it. How is that quantified um, differently than properties that are built? If I'm director on or sorry, President please, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Chavez. Great question. Um, I'm assuming you'd like me to focus the answer on uh, the context within the, the community plan policy framework going forward, right? Yes, please. Okay. I don't want to get bogged down in history. Um, so going forward, uh, the policy would be that any housing built uh, directly on campus um, under a general use permit approval would, would count towards the housing linkage policy 
which is shorthand for if you build, if the university builds X amount of academic space, there's a certain amount of housing uh, that needs to go along with that. And that's the, that's the, that's the, how, that's the, that's the core of the housing linkage policy. Uh, a little history. Historically, all that housing had to be on physically on uh, the academic campus within the unincorporated area, uh, except for a uh, provision for some of the affordable housing that uh, could be provided uh, through an in-loop fee payment, which would occur off campus. But going forward, all of the housing would have to occur on campus with an allowance, however, that up to 30% of that required housing could be provided off campus, but within the close in uh, Stanford lands that happen to be within the city of Palo Alto, where there's been a long history of providing um, housing that essentially functions as university housing, even though it is technically off of the academic campus. At the, if I may through the chair, but yes. the question, Jeff, um, that the supervisor asked, just for clarity, is All right. how does it differ when Stanford acquires a housing development that's already built? relative to building a housing development. Thank you. Thank you for refocusing me. Um, the, the community plan policies are written in such a way that the credit, so to speak, for new housing supplied under the housing linkage policy also, again, by definition, would be net new housing. Mm -hmm. So pur simply purchasing an existing housing complex um, wouldn't actually count under the, the requirement to provide uh, housing uh, that is justified through the nexus analysis. Again, that housing linkage policy, certain amount of housing required required for a certain amount of academic development has to be new housing units, either physically constructed on campus or new housing units constructed off campus, but within the Stanford land grant area. So um, as a follow-up to that, when, to go back to the the question, and I, I recall that Stanford was very interested in this when we um, were working on the GUP, the the development of housing toward a future GUP, and and the um, and again, what I'm really trying to better understand is the underpinnings of philosophically how we're approaching res the responsibility of the organization, and what I'm particularly interested in understanding is how the structure that that is being discussed today in continues to incent um stanford to build more housing jeff Cor uh, correct the the goal of the housing policies within the community plan um are acknowledged that they also have to work in combination with the county's housing element There'll be a number of sites out. May, may I, if I may, Sylvia yes. Gallegos, Deputy County Executive, I wanted to also expand on Mr. Bradley's comments by indicating that on October 18th, we will um, address and specifically respond to the concerns that Stanford's identified. And we, we understand your question and we'll respond uh, more fully on the 18th. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, Dr. Smith has also raised his hand. May I recognize him for a moment? Of course, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Smith. I didn't mean to take any priority off the discussion. I just um, wanted to make a comment about um, postdocs. Um, as the board considers a way to create affordable housing, um, you know, in universities, there are numerous groups of individuals who are having troubles with affordability for different reasons. And one of the groups is the postdocs where basically they're way underpaid and there's been efforts for unionization and other efforts to try to deal with that. Um, you know, I think right now at Stanford, the ranges of salaries are in the 60,000 range which is you know, far inadequate given the region. Um, and universities tend to believe that that compensation is in addition to the training that they're, the value of the training that they're getting. But postdocs really <clears throat> are used to do 
<clears throat> lots of work that uh, doctorates um, and faculty members don't want to do. So um, I think it would be useful for the board to consider in a different arena, not a land use arena, um, the possibility of compelling a more uh, reasonable salary for postdocs wouldn't solve all of the problem, but certainly something that should not be ignored. Thank you. Subhash Chavez. Thank you. Um, I, I guess that just to ask this question, Sylvia, are you are you waiting on the response because that's still something that's being considered? We are actively discussing the um, concerns raised by Stanford, and we wanted to use this opportunity to hear specific concerns or questions by the board so that we can provide that holistic response on the 18th. Got it. Okay. So just for, for my, for my um, I, I'm really wanting to better understand um, just how the plan incents the behavior we most want and whether or not by creating opportunities, um, we, we create more opportunities for housing to be constructed on site. That's really the question. And I, I, I genuinely don't have an, a thought about it. I'm, I'm really curious about your perspective on it. Um, if I could just move to vehicle miles traveled for a moment relative to the, um, to this, the study before us. The recent change, I get, what I'm trying to understand is the change, if any, in state law, how that has fundamentally um, improved or impacted the study that's before us. Who can handle that one? Yes, uh, Jeff. A little slow on my, my trigger finger this morning. Um, yes, VMT uh, is with us for sure, and the community plan has embraced it. Um, the any future development on the campus in terms of transportation will be evaluated from a SQL analysis uh, based on vehicle miles traveled and Stanford is in a unique position to have a very good uh, a good outcome uh, because of the density of development there as well as uh, close by services and transit facilities so the the VMT itself uh, should be fairly low which is a which is a good thing however Due to our uh, county code requirements around approving new general use permits and our finding to not significantly increase local congestion, we are continuing to explore and refine uh, policies around the no net, no net new commute trip, which is longstanding, as well as uh, the reverse trips uh, that we're, we're continuing to, to work with Stanford and the staff to, to refine so that they are uh, responsible to the concerns about congestion and reducing it and limiting it in the area, but also at, to your point, your earlier point about housing, not disincentivizing uh, the construction of housing on the campus, which in and of itself uh, would, would have a very good VMT uh, aspect. So we're trying to capture all of that. Um, and it's, it's a bit of a balancing act, but we are confident uh, that we're moving in the right direction. So on the vehicle miles traveled component, um... What just to share information that I would be very interested in understanding is I think each local government, whether it's a county or cities, is struggling a little bit with how um, how the impacts relative to VMT get translated into TDM or traffic calming or whatever the whatever the the outcome is that we want, and that the the thing I would just want to make sure of is that, in the plan, there is both the, the that there's some clarity about the expectations the community should have relative to the new standard of VMT. And I mention that because it's it's still so new that that I don't think we have a consistent way of responding to it. And and maybe maybe that's okay, but not having a I would just challenge our our planning. Uh, director, uh, not challenge, but ask that we think about, sorry about that, um, that we think about the framework we want to offer the public so there's some consistency in the way we take in what the implications of vehicle miles traveled are and what the public can expect relative to um, traffic mitigation. Because to me, it doesn't seem clear at all. And just looking at different jurisdictions, it doesn't seem consistent yet to me either. 
Um, and if it is, I, I'd love to know that. And if we have a framework, great. And if we recognize that that's still something we're going to have to work on, I just want to understand how that gets expressed in a plan that's this um, long, right? Just because we're at the beginning of it. Um, that's real. That would be really helpful. Um, then one last um, just area that I, I'm I'm curious about is um, when when you showed the map of the the surrounding areas and you know I'm always kind of struck by the, how how much the world doesn't operate on on our boundaries we act like it does but it really doesn't right and I am very interested in making sure that. Um, there's been some review by, in particular, San Mateo County, and that we get their their thoughts um, directly into the the um, the planning process in the cities that are most impacted. And and not I understand we have our own decision making process. It's really just that um, the the importance of those neighboring partners, particularly as it relates to the housing and the and transportation are just too critical. And I and I apologize if they, they did make comments and I just didn't see them in my packet. Um, you know, I'll, I'll make sure I'm I'm them before we take a final vote, but I would like to make sure we at least did one final pass with them before this comes to the board for final action. Thank you. I see the nodding of heads. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you, staff, for coming up with a very <clears throat> comprehensive uh, 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 report. And I apologize. I actually did not read through the three and a half inch uh, <laughs> thick document, but I tried to focus on a couple of things that I actually could understand, uh, of which, of course, is regarding the housing and how many has been created. So uh, on page 14 of the slide, I just wanted some clarification questions. It says that the current plan has a creation of 60 new faculty and staff housing units on campus, uh, 4,400 new student beds on campus. The one I don't understand, I guess, is the 1023 um, on land grant property, something about being purchased uh, el elsewhere. Could you uh, is the, uh, uh, state that again? Brittany, do you want to uh, pull yeah. up that slide? Uh maybe walk through Sean it. Can pull, Sean can pull up the slide, but I can talk through the numbers. Brittany, why don't you wait till the slide's up? Sure. There Great. You go. Yeah, that's the one. Great, so we have 60, uh, 60 new faculty and staff housing units built on campus, and this is since the 2000 SCP. Um, 4,400 new student beds on campus. And then 1,023 new faculty and staff housing units on Stanford land grant properties. And so you'll see that's kind of in the yellowish tinted area on the edges right. um, and circled in red. Right. And then what's not shown here is a recent acquisition by Stanford along Sand Hill Road that added an additional 750, approximately 750 units. To this information right so 723 the 750 is not included the 1023 right correct okay so here's the thing is so those 750 to me um i wouldn't certainly not add them to the slide because to me it's not really adding new um units for staff i mean it might be exclusively for staff but you're actually picking out away from the community i guess our goal here is really increasing the number of housing in the area uh so by by purchasing it, it's certainly dedicated more for the staff, which is good for the staff uh, faculty. Certainly, I think it's important, but at the same time, it's, it is actually taking away from the community, right? So, uh, kind of limited the use. So, I think I, I think that's something I want to make sure clarify. So, the 750 is not including in the 1023. Now, then the 1023 are those going to be new new when you say new housing? They are actually new construction. Is that correct? These, uh, Supervisor Lee, these are, this is Jeff Bradley again. Uh, this slide is really looking backwards um, mm -hmm. and documenting uh, things that are existing. Mm -hmm. So some, some of this housing was built, uh, like Brittany said, going all the way back to the 2001 timeframe. And then some of it, such as Escondido Village, the large uh, student, uh, grad student housing uh, was, was built within the, just within the last few years. So right. this, 
basically looking at housing activity of uh, during the what we would consider the current general use permit uh, okay. is in effect. Great. Okay. All right. Thank you. I guess I, I am really focused on 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 what exactly is the impact to the community at the end of the day. That's what matters to me. Uh, and certainly, what we're hoping for is the the creation of new units uh, and not taking it away from the community. Is the my point. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Uh, thank you, and we can go ahead and take the slide down if uh, that's okay, Mr. Chair. Yep. Thanks so much. Oops, uh, I'm sorry, Supervisor Smitty and Supervisor Lee, your hand is still raised. Did you have an additional comment? Sorry, I'll take it down. Thank you, Supervisor Smitty. Thanks. Um, I I am. Uh, I'm thinking this must bring back fond memories to Supervisor Chavez, who uh, got a PhD in Stanford uh, land use issues uh, during the three years we served on the task force together. Uh, and um, uh, but there have been some new developments, so I'm glad we're having the study session. Uh, and um, uh, Mr. Wasserman, you have heard some of this, uh, uh, of course, in our recent Hewlett hearings and. Uh, for Supervisor Lee, uh, a lot of this is, um, you know, uh, welcome to the Board of Supervisors present, I guess. Uh, it's complicated stuff. Here's here's what I would say to, to try and frame the conversation today uh, and ask our staff to be mindful of this frame, um, you know, as one member uh, of the board, be mindful of this frame when we take up the conversation uh, more fully on October 18th. And that is the, the notion of development uh, review by our board uh, under almost any circumstance is one that requires us to ask ourselves, when someone comes forward with a development, it inevitably has impacts on the surrounding community. And we go through a review, including an environmental impact review, but other reviews for compliance with our general plan, our community plan, our ordinances, to ensure that the project fully mitigates its impacts. And I know full mitigation is a phrase Supervisor Chavez heard, heard a lot during the course of three years, but it's really a very, I think, simple and appropriate way to frame the conversation, which is to say, all right, we, we're going to keep an open mind from start to finish about what somebody proposes, but ultimately the decision has to be predicated on an evaluation of whether or not the impacts are fully mitigated, whether those are uh, traffic impacts or housing impacts. And to Supervisor Lee's point, it, you know, um, really there are only three options uh, when there's a development that proceeds. Either the applicant can mitigate the impacts that their project creates, or the cost of mitigating those impacts can be pushed off on the surrounding community, or the impacts don't get mitigated and things get worse, like the housing crisis and traffic. So as I say, really, there's just three options. At, at one level, it's kind of simple, which is, do we have a structure that ensures that development sort of uh, addresses its own impacts as we proceed, or do we push those costs and burdens off on the surrounding community, or do we just let things get worse, which I think given the state of our traffic and our housing, we're not prepared to do. So really what I'm looking, and I and I know our surrounding communities don't think they should absorb the cost, uh, and of course that's what the tri-party agreement was all about, which was that if there were municipal services, for example, those costs would be borne by the university, uh, as a, a consequence of unincorporated development. So full, full mitigation, fully mitigating these things is really uh, what it's about. And I want to go through the various areas that have been addressed uh, and uh, tee them up. Um, on the issue of uh, new units, I think, Mr. Bradley, the reason that got uh, housing units, that got a little bit uh, confusing is because I think really Supervisor Chavez's very good question goes to the issue of creating new units, which does in fact add to the units available either for a campus population or the general population. And um, the distinction between creating new units and simply acquiring existing units for the benefit of the university. 
And the story that Supervisor Lee and I think Supervisor Chavez referenced about more than 750 units at Oak Creek Apartments being purchased by the university um, is uh, one that has caused quite a bit of buzz here in um, my district because on the one hand, it's a smart move for the university to acquire those units and to have those units available to address the existing demand, which should be an indication of the need for more housing um, on the campus. On the other hand, there's no way around this. The surrounding community, the general public, just lost 750 units of housing in the midst of a housing crisis. I, I mean, that's that's the inevitable consequence. And I, I say that without in any way, shape, or form criticizing the university. They made the smart move for the university, uh, but it it means that at a time when we're trying to figure out how we can get more housing units uh, into the community, um, we now have 750 fewer or will over time as people leave those units and they are replaced by uh, Stanford faculty and staff. So I think the um, the community plan amendments that the uh, that the staff is talking about are uh, are on point uh, because they actually do uh, approach this from the standpoint of fully mitigating the impacts and requiring that there be net new units actually built. And um, the place where I thought we could allow a little flexibility, colleagues, when we talked about this in the Hewlett uh, hear hearings, was in terms of the location of those units. So, uh, you know, if you put the units over in Oakland, uh, that's a problem. Uh, that's uh, if you put the units in, you know, adjacent properties, uh, the Stanford Shopping Center or the Stanford Research Park. Um, that's a real solution if they are indeed new units and they are close to the core campus, the 4,000 acres that we have planning responsibility for. Now, you know, that's over and above, uh, you know, assuming these are for campus folks, over and above whatever uh, the city of Palo Alto uh, needs to see to address their issues. But um, it, need, it needs to be new units. And uh, the place I personally draw a red line is no, we can't. We can't give folks for um, credit for units that they built two, five, ten, or twenty years ago. We we went through this conversation during the GUP uh, process, uh, and the first thing I would say is you start going down that path, and then the question is, well, are we going to have to deduct 759 units that just left the market? Uh, by virtue of the Stanford purchase. I don't think anybody wants to uh, make that suggestion. Um, and, and yet, that would be the logical consequence of taking this, this view. Um, Supervisor Chavez, you may remember that there was the announcement from Stanford that it wanted credit for student housing it had built at Escondido Village. I think it was a thousand plus beds. Uh, and uh, it was the darndest thing because our staff came back and said, no, we're not going to apply credit for units you already built to meet a pre-existing demand for student housing and say that should be credited against a future. That's That just didn't make any sense at all. And I'm, I'm looking at uh, from the, the file that is uh, too many boxes, uh, a, a note from uh, our planning staff that said, no, the $4.7 billion community benefits package that the university proffered at one point in the conversation actually was uh, valued at less than $170 million, meaning, um, you know, was off by 95%. Um, as a planning matter, it, you know, we don't say, gee, you were a good actor two, five, 10, or 20 years ago. What we say is, Let's take a look at what you're about to develop. What are the housing impacts? And if we have a housing linkage policy, which our board led on 20 years ago, then we say, let's see some housing that will make sure that the housing crisis, both the supply and the cost, isn't made worse by your proposed development. And as I say, for me, that's, a, that's an absolute uh, red line. I can't uh, count and uh, anything other than that, the place where we did have some flexibility in our conversation at the 
Hewlett was, as I say, about you know adjacent Stanford lands or other Stanford lands. The challenges, uh, some of you will recall, is that Stanford lands are in six different jurisdictions. Uh, and um, this is actually an issue where we have heard, as Supervisor Chavez referenced, from uh, the surrounding folks across these artificial boundaries. And Supervisor Chavez buried in all our paper is the letter from um, the folks in Atherton, Redwood City, and San Mateo County saying they support the staff recommendations as proposed. So I just wanted Thank to you. underscore that. Um, and I think we'll probably hear from more of those communities as we get closer to the 18th. Um, then on the on the issue of vehicle miles traveled versus um, uh, trip counts, uh, Ms. Bendix uh, did a great job of explaining this to our committee. We didn't spend as much time on it today, so I, I, I think it makes sense that there were questions, Ms. Bendix. I think um, I'm going to look to Ms. Bendix and Mr. Bradley to be my uh, phone of friends here and keep me uh, accurate, which is um, my recollection from our committee discussion is vehicle miles traveled is now the standard for EIR work, meaning when we do an environmental impact report. But that doesn't mean that trip counts are no longer relevant. Quite the opposite. I remember, Ms. Bendix, you holding up that copy of our own county ordinance that said we couldn't de approve developments where there was a substantial adverse impact on traffic, which is, of course, what trip counts are about. And the point I made at the meeting, colleagues, was, yeah, vehicle miles traveled is something we really do want people to work on. And, you know, it's great if the vehicle miles traveled dropped from 100 to 50. But if the number of trips in proximity to the campus doubles or triples and people are stuck in traffic, you know, in the proximity to the campus, then th that's, that's, no, that's no consolation to them having a doubling or tripling of trips by virtue of growth um, is uh, the thing we all experience. When we're sitting in traffic stuck behind somebody and the traffic is not moving and we're sitting there polluting the, the air, we're all saying to ourselves, why is this not moving? And the answer is because there are now three times as many trips for a strained infrastructure as there were before. And so essentially what the community plan amendments say, and Mr. Bradley and Ms. Mendix, I'm going to look to you, is, and I'm obviously speaking in lay language and colloquially, is, hey, you know, um, if you want to grow, that's okay, but you need to find some way to make sure you don't add to the number of trips in and out of the campus. And that's by virtue of a trip count. And um, I will just say here by way of clarification, Ms. Bendix, I, there was not a, a, an indication, certainly not by me, and I don't remember Supervisor Wasserman, not an indication that reverse commute trips were an area where flexibility should be granted. I, the, the flexibility was on the issue of how folks get credit for, um, for, for trip count. So, and what, what we've talked about in the past, and Supervisor Chavez, I don't know if you'll remember this from our long ago conversations is, look, if the university says, we just can't reduce our trip count anymore with the growth that we want to envision, then the flexibility was by saying, okay, you can do some trip reduction in the larger community and use that as a credit against your own trip reduction. And that gives them the flexibility. And, and, you know, for example, the Marguerite, which they've already done, is one of the ways they do that. And it's a, it's a you know, swell way to do it. Forgive my lack of uh, planning jargon there. Swell way is probably not a, a planning term. But um, so, yes, flexibility about how you do it, because nobody uh, really wants to try and, you know, design that for the university. I've never heard anybody say they care about that. But in terms of the net number of trips, there's a threshold question, which is, should we allow growth and development on the core campus, which makes traffic worse than it is today in the surrounding area? And I think we all think the answer to that question is no. And then, you know, there are lots of ways creative people can figure out how to uh, reduce trips in the surrounding area. And as a practical matter, somebody sitting in traffic doesn't know or care whether the three cars in front of them are headed to the campus or somewhere else, they just wish there was only one car in front of them instead of three. So I think that's where we are 
on that issue. On the 99 uh, years, uh, in terms of the four-fifths majority, uh, that hasn't been a big topic today, but what I will say is um, we talked at the committee level about the fact that um, this doesn't say that something can't happen. It just says, by God, if you're going to do that, you got some hoops you got to jump through. The first hoop would be four-fifths rather than uh, um, a simple majority. And I sort of smile that people make a thing of this because, as colleagues all know, we, we can't do a mid-year appropriation for $100 without getting a four-fifths vote of our board of supervisors if we're off budget cycle. So for something as dramatic as this, uh, requiring four-fifths, I think, is not unreasonable. Uh, the other thing I would say is, um, as has been pointed out, it only takes a simple majority, three votes, to eliminate the four-fifths requirement. But again, the fact that it says four-fifths, and that's a hoop people would jump through, makes it less likely. And I, I just have to say, um, you know, Mr. Bradley, I'm going to pull you into this one, whether you want to be pulled or not. One of the things that you kept reminding us with the sustainability study was that the sustainability study indicated that the, the university could grow nearly three times its current size on the core campus without any need to expand up into the foothills. Am I remembering that correctly, sir? That's correct, Supervisor. Yeah, so the whole notion here was that by laying down that 99-year marker for the foothills, we would encourage smart growth on the core campus, for which there is tremendous capacity as identified by the sustainability study, rather than encourage people to think about pushing up into the foothills. That's why 99 years later. And the last thing I have to say is I, I chafe a little when the university says, oh, gee, we need greater flexibility than that because interestingly enough on Stanford lands on the Stanford Research Park, there are long-term leases there that are 75 years and 99 years. And my point would be that apparently the flexibility wasn't necessary when there was income generation uh, by those properties, uh, but somehow the flexibility is uh, requested uh, when it comes to protecting the foothills and encouraging um, smart growth. The, um, Concerns by Mr. McKenzie and Mr. Williams and other uh, postdocs and graduate students are ones I'd like to ask the consultants to be prepared to comment on more fully at the meeting on October the 18th. I, I want to make sure that in the sort of big picture conversation we're having, uh, those issues uh, don't get lost. Um, and I think... Um, One of the things that I think was uh, a, a good outcome of this effort was that uh, rather than looking at in lieu fees, um, that the housing would actually get created, because I think we've all learned how hard it is to get housing created. And uh, rather than just take a fee and hope that someday that works, I think we do want to see the housing. Uh, I would, um, I'm flipping through my notes, colleagues. Thank you for your patience. Uh, I think those are my uh, primary points, uh, Mr. Chair, I, which is I think we're in the right place on no net new trips. I think we're in the right place on making sure that there are actual units built uh, and that that's a requirement going forward, not looking back over our shoulder. Uh, and uh, I think the 99 years uh, really does need to stay. I think if it's a flexibility that people are asking for, not a loophole, but flexibility about how those goals are realized. I think uh, you want to encourage staff uh, to pursue those. And the last thing I would say is if, you know, I, I took Supervisor Chavez's point um, as one we've struggled with all along about how do you incentivize housing production? And the answer is when somebody comes forward with a project and they want to develop it, if they've already built housing, when you do the EIR and you do the nexus study, if they've mitigated housing demands in the past, then there won't be a big dramatic need. If they haven't, then, um, and there's an expectation that they address the issue, uh, then they got a problem. And that's where we ran into challenges with the 2018, 2019 GUP process, which is um, the nexus study said, and Mr. Bradley uh, helped me with my memory here, 
I think the Nexus study said we needed something like 2,200 units of workforce housing. The university said, you, you know, we're only prepared to do 550 units of housing. And we all said, well, you know, we can't live with making the problem 1,500 plus units worse. And that's when we got this really, I thought, very extraordinary proposal to please count previously built student beds against future demand for workforce housing. And, you know, fortunately, at every level, our staff and our planning commission said that doesn't make sense. Thank you. With all of that, I'll just say thanks again to staff and the consulting group for a job well done. Uh, and uh, look forward to seeing the product uh, that you bring in a slightly refined way to our October 18th meeting. Thank you, Supervisor. I don't see any other hands raised. I want to thank Jeff and Brittany and, and uh, your organization for what you brought forth today. Um, I digested it once during Hewlett. I digested it again over this weekend. The 28-page uh, summary was very helpful compared to the 850 other pages. So uh, I, I appreciate that. I think what's being developed here is very, very, very important work to uh, safeguard the immediately adjacent communities and the surrounding area in, in general. I think there's a way for us to get to the right place. I'm looking forward to being part of that vote that gets us to the right place and, uh, and getting this very important work done. Thank you all very much. Supervisors, if there's no further objection, we will now move on to item number nine, which is a public hearing implementation of energy storage systems at 9400 No Name Uno in Gilroy. And for the record, I am opening the public hearing and looking for any testimony. Nancy, I don't see any members of the public wishing to speak. We do have one now. Yes, you, I see could one. Could you please recognize that individual? Absolutely. We'll get the timer on the screen. Thank you. Blair Beekman, I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for all your work on the previous item. Uh, for this item, I have not quite read through it yet, but from what you've just described of it, uh, good luck how we talk about the future of storage procurement issues and the, and the use of, of solar as a storage uh, facility uh, concept. Uh, as a basic uh, concept, I hope that as it was the future of uh, all the uh, uh, rare earth minerals that will be needed in the future of storage and our overall uh, uh, you know, sustainable future package that we really consider the uh, worker rights issues involved in having to mine all those minerals. And that always should be a part of the uh, formula of how we think of our, 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 our sustainable future package. Uh, a, a quick reminder, you know, a real good luck how to really address renewable energy ideas uh, and, and their storage possibilities. Um, I, I, I think its potential could be more important than, than nuclear and more meaningful to ourselves. Good luck how to find those ways of working and avenues of working. And, and good luck how to explain to myself, I'm not fully clear yet, myself in, in the renewable future package and the importance of local procurement, does that mean actually that we do have to rely a bit more on fossil fuels at this beginning time? Uh, to learn to describe that to the public, I think would really be helpful. Uh, and, and what can be our options uh, to limit fossil fuel use as, as we maybe, uh, as we can uh, work towards uh, an important renewable future. Thank you. Thank you. With that, I'm going to close the public hearing. I'm going to look for a motion, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, uh, President Wasserman. I uh, certainly want to move forward and uh, encourage uh, my colleague to support this really long overdue project. Uh, so I'll make a motion to approve. Thank you. Supervisor Chavez. I'll second. I just have a question. Thank you. And I'm going to be happy to support this in Gilroy as well. Supervisor Chavez, go ahead. Yeah, thank you very much. I was wondering if the staff could just talk through the, um, the mechanism to determine the option for purchase. 
you know, for example, how, you know, fair market value and all that, your six, how would that process work? Uh, yeah. uh, good morning, Brad Vance, Utilities Analyst for Facilities and Fleet. Um, that would be done through um, a third party um, valuation. Um, and there is a process that out there. Um, Brad, that's Brad, done, we're having a tough time understanding. The parties thereafter. Oh. Can you speak more directly, um, to Mike, perhaps? Let me take out my mic. There you go. That's perfect. That that's perfect. Can you? Yes. Can you hear me better now? Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Brad. No, you were fine before. President Wasserman, if it's okay, we can go ahead and put a formal response back. Um, seems like Brad is having some technical difficulties at this Thank time. Thank you, Susanna. Absolutely. So, yeah, let me let me just say what would be um, what would be helpful is I, I would like an off agenda report that outlines what's in the embedded in the contract for that process. So that that's actually the first question. The second question is, um, and this has more to do with just not not yet seeing a master plan for all the healthcare institutions. And so perhaps this is something that I don't know if Dr. Smith is still on. I imagine he is. Go oh, ahead. Now we have Greta here. Oh, great. Well, the real question I wanted to ask is the the value of the leasehold interest because the on the site, you know, given whatever other um, interests we may have in terms of development. And I just wanted to ask um, the process we went through to determine this land would not be necessary for development, but able to be used for this purpose, because it's quite a lot of acres, actually. Absolutely. We can put that together in the formal response to you. Is, does that exist? Can someone answer that question before we take a vote on this? Um, the main, the yes, main issue you. that we had to deal with was the need for the service. Um, and, you know, there is still quite a bit of land around the property. So we don't think that this utilization of land will impact any future development. Um, we've got many acres, plus there are surrounding property owners who are interested in selling or leasing additional acres around the hospital. So um, I can't say that we did any extensive process because uh, we're still in the, in the uh, process of giving you a master plan for all three sites and the clinics but uh you know we this particular utilization is going to be critical no matter what so dr smith do you know when that um when that massing study will be done um i can't give you the date off the top of my head um but it's making quite a bit of progress uh, we were initially planning to have it done in the summer, um, but um, then there were concerns that the board raised appropriately about uh, utilization of other pieces of property like the um, BAP and uh, Donlow Pavilion and changes based on the emergency room needs and how that interacts with the um, new psych facility and parking on VMC. And we also had um, new issues about a child advocacy, a child advocacy center and the center of excellence at O'Connor. So um, that changed the presumptions quite a bit. So we felt that the original plan that we had was not responsive and that's why we're going back to the drawing board and be more responsive to the new issues that the board brought up i forgot to bring up the other idea of a forensic unit uh, which would be a um, custody environment inside a jail to be able to provide behavioral health services um, controlled by uh, healthcare professionals so um, 
Got it. And Dr. Smith, what, what my request would be is, um, I, I think all of what you raised makes a lot of sense and that's going to make it more complicated. If in November, um, we could just get an assessment of when that, when even at its broadest uh, would be available. And I appreciate the point you raised about the available properties here. I also know that we're looking at some of those properties for, for other activities, including housing. And um, so what you say makes a lot of sense. And if we could just get a report out, even if it's under your report in November would be helpful. And then the other off agenda report, just on the, I'm, I'm very interested in the, um, in under what circumstances we might be interested in purchasing this, you know, year six, and also being just concerned about extending a contract here um, long term without that massing study is is really just I, and I recognize that sometimes you just have to go and go forward. So I, I realize that's where we are now. So I'm happy to second the motion with the request for um, your report in November, just with a, a broad timeline, and then staff giving an off agenda on the on the process embedded in the contract for procurement. Okay, sounds good. And Supervisor Lee, is that all right with you? Yes. Motion maker? Yep. Yes. Supervisor Chavez, your hand is down. So we've got the motion and the second and the additional notes agreed upon by Dr. Smith. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. And President Wasserman? Aye as well. Thank you very much. And supervisors, let's handle 10, another public hearing. Um, then we'll need to come back for 11, 15, and 17, and uh, county exec and county council. Well, let's go to 10 right now. And 10 is to open a public hearing and adopt a resolution regarding the formation of the Santa Clara County Central Fire Protection District Service Zone 3. And I'm going to open the public hearing and receive testimony. Supervisor Smitty, your hand is raised. Only uh, for a motion after the public hearing is closed, sir. Thank you very much. So the public hearing has been officially opened. Nancy, I don't see any members of the public registered to speak. Do you agree? I agree, yeah. Thank you. I'm going to close the public hearing, turn to Supervisor Smitty and for the motion. Thank you. Then I will move the staff recommendation and assuming there's a second, just speak briefly. Okay. I'll be happy. Okay. Oh, Supervisor sorry. Lee, you got the second. Thank you, uh, 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 Supervisor Wasserman. Thank you, Supervisor Lee. I was not surprised Supervisor Lee leaned in because he knows that this territory and uh, what happens here affects his district uh, and my district. Uh, and I just wanted to say thank you to the staff for um, doing the financial analysis that I thought would be important in allowing us to uh, make a fully informed decision and then justify it, frankly, uh, if anyone raised questions. Establishing zone three uh, within the district, the central fire district is, I think, both appropriate, but also, frankly, just prudent from a fiscal and policy standpoint. Uh, it continues the longstanding precedent and practice of not allowing cross-subsidization within the territories that comprise central fire. Uh, I know our new chief knows uh, all that. Absent zone three, which is what we're creating today, uh, taxpayers in the Central Fire Zone 2, uh, a lot of them in my district, I'm thinking Los Gatos, Montesorino, Cupertino, Saratoga, unincorporated areas, uh, it would have faced increased cost or decreased levels of service to subsidize the cost of fire service at NASA Ames. So um, it, the NASA Ames property should cover its fire response costs and not be allowed to shift those costs to taxpayers in Central Fire Zone 2. I appreciate the fact that staff anticipated all that, brought this to us, and um, establishing zone three will ensure that protection. So um, I, I got a press call on this one yesterday, which surprised me a little bit because it's kind of a wonky subject. Uh, but uh, you know what I was able to say pretty clearly and what I think staff has communicated quite well is that with zone three, the taxpayers of Central Fire Zone 2 will not subsidize the cost of fire response at NASA Ames. Thank you. Thank you. And we're saving public money and increasing services. Supervisor Lee, your comments? Yes, thank you. Yeah, I certainly do support the creation of Zone 3 so that we can provide a needed level of service to this area. 
Looking forward, I foresee that the Santa Clara County Fire District will play a key role in safeguarding the residents of this county as we are seeing that the fire season certainly is getting longer and longer. And we definitely need to make sure that they have all the resources needed to do the job we ask of them. So thank you. Thank you. We have a motion. We have a second. I see Chief Kirk Gow there. Do you just want to salute or have something to say? You're muted, Chief. You are still muted. We're going to take it that you I'm reading your lips and you're saying this is a wonderful thing to do and how much you appreciate the supervisors. Am I close? Thumbs up. Wonderful. All right. Supervisor Smitty, and your hand is raised. Do you have additional comments or take yes for an answer? All right. Good. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee. Hi. Supervisor Chavez. Yes. Supervisor Simidian. Aye. And President Wasserman. Yes. Thank you very much. All right. It is 12.06. I'm going to turn to County Council first for your report, James. There were no reportable actions taken at the closed session meeting of September 26, 2022, and that concludes my report. Thank you. Dr. Smith, do you have a report to give? Yes, Mr. President, members of the board, I wanted to give you an update uh, about the uh, booster, I mean, uh, vaccine requirements in the county. Um, the board has received um, information about that, but for the public, I should let people know that um, we had intended from a staff perspective to um, institute the new policy um, today or yesterday, I'm sorry, but we're in the midst of negotiations still with uh, SEIU, so it won't be implemented until that um, process is complete. But the intent is to rescind the booster requirement so that individuals are considered up to date when they have received two um, vaccines in the series. Uh, we have available now the bivalent booster and the recommendation from the CDC is you should have the first two uh, in the series, whether it's Moderna or uh, Pfizer, and then two other uh, boosters of the same or um, equivalent, and then you should have the bivalent, but we're not requiring that for employees. Um, we're continuing with the reasonable accommodation process, um, and we are continuing with the evaluation of individuals in low, intermediate, and high-risk uh, environments, but we're changing the rules. So first of all, for those individuals who um, are working in high-risk environments, um, if they have a exemption, either a religious or medical exemption, they can come back and continue to work. Uh, we're requiring them to have, um, to utilize uh, N95 or equivalent PPE and to get testing at this point twice a week, either PCR or antigen testing for individuals in medium risk environments. Again, with, um, I'm talking about unvaccinated individuals. I should make that clear. Um, with exemptions, um, they are required to use N95s, no testing is required. And for those individuals in low risk who are not vaccinated, um, they're required to do masking, um, doesn't have to be an N95. Um, we um, are continuing to look at our masking protocols, but as was, I think, mentioned uh, last meeting and continues to be true, um, there continues to be a large uh, presence of uh, COVID in the community and the variants continue to be present. So we're going to continue uh, with uh, 
masking at this point. Um, I think that gives everything that's required regarding COVID. Uh, we also should notify you that uh, flu vaccine is available and obviously we always recommend vaccination for flu and we're watching closely on MPOX um, continues to increase in numbers in the county, but continues to be um, primarily focused upon uh, individuals of Hispanic origin, males having um, sex with males. And we're continuing to focus our efforts to vaccinate those groups as rapidly as possible. Um, and we will expand as uh, more vaccine becomes available. And um, I think that's about it. Um, we did have, as I was gone, you know, some significant heat um, disasters uh, where we did have some um, severe impact. Um, that doesn't look like it's in the future. Um, but we'll keep our close eye on that. That's about all I have. Thank you, Dr. Smith. Um, I see Supervisor Lee may have a question of you. And then board members, uh, go right ahead, Supervisor Lee. Thank you, uh, Dr. Smith. Welcome back. Um, questions on the uh, bivalent uh, vaccines now that they are made available. Uh, I knew there were a little bit of a shortage in, in the beginning, but looks like we are have it pretty under control now in terms of people scheduling getting the vaccines, correct? Yes, there was a bit of a shortage um, initially, but it looks like we have a sufficient number certainly to meet demand. Um, as I think the board's aware, uh, demand has not been as vigorous as it was for the initial series. Um, you know, many people feel like the pandemic's over. It didn't help that the president announced the pandemic was over because it's not over, but um, the number, the vaccine available is adequate for the demand. Thank you. Okay, and then the uh, uh, recommendation is that for those who have had a prior vaccine or had uh, caught COVID, they should wait, what, 90 days before they get the new bivalent vaccine, is that correct? Yeah, I was just looking that up because uh, Europe was bad to me and it is 90 days. <laughs> okay. Thank yep. you. Thank you. And, uh, and uh, sorry about the, uh, the incident. Yeah, I caught it myself in, in, in uh, Europe as well. And certainly, it, it's certainly, I, I feel like it's very much, it is everywhere, especially uh, the fact that people are not wearing masks at all does not mean that COVID is gone. It just means that uh, the, the fact that it actually be more transmittable uh, with less protection for people. So I think that's something that people get confused sometimes. Uh, all of us are so sick and tired of wearing the mask and having to do all those social distancing uh, uh, paradigm. But at the same time, uh, you know, we're coming up to the fall, right? And uh, everybody knows not if the matter, it's not matter if it's a matter when the next variant will be here and how Berlin is going to be uh, maybe this, this coming winter. So uh, we certainly still need to remain vigilant. And thank you for the report, Dr. Smith. Supervisor Simidian. Thank you. Uh, on a non-agendized <laughs> item, but I do want to take advantage of the uh, kind of executive's report just to make a request uh, in a public forum, Mr. Mr. Chair. Mm -hmm. um, you will recall, colleagues, that uh, we approved um, the use of uh, Harvey Rose and their subcontractor Veneer to provide some additional increment of oversight on the uh, project that I call Teen Beds, the uh, the psychiatric facility for acute care uh, for uh, teenagers and kids. And um, I think that effort has yet to really get the traction it requires because we have not yet uh, approved a contract with a new contractor. But Dr. Smith, I'd like to ask you uh, if we could please um, count on you to direct staff to give the Harvey Rose and Veneer people access to the current discussions about how we get to a contract sooner rather than later. I know those efforts are underway, but um, Again, the whole notion of using the Rose firm and veneer 
was to provide some reassurance to our board and the public and to provide some transparency. And, and frankly, we're just not there yet if they're not in those conversations. So I'm gonna put a referral on our October 18th uh, board meeting, Mr. Chair of HHC, uh, excuse me, at our October 18th board meeting, forgive me, I misspoke, after uh, we have had a chance to discuss this more fully at our next HHC meeting, which is what I should have said. And, um, but the best outcome in my judgment would be if uh, the county executive would simply communicate to line staff that um, the process needs to be opened up to our oversight team. Uh, the Harvey Rose and Veneer people report to our board, and that's why we are using uh, that approach. Thank you. Um, let me address that um, yes. a little bit. I did watch the um, health and hospital meeting after uh, uh, that occurred while I was gone. And I think uh, some of the communications were a little fuzzy um, and incorrect. I just want to let the board know that we will have a contract in front of the board in November uh, with uh, the contractor that we're currently negotiating with. I can't really say that name in public, but I think the board knows which contractor we're working with and it should be in front of the board in November but certainly we'll communicate to staff to, um, you know, in, include uh, Veneer and Harvey Rose in the communications and um, let them obviously report back to the board about their feelings and findings, uh, but we're pushing the project as fast as possible. Thank you for that uh, through the chair and uh, feel better, Dr. Smith. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Supervisor Chavez. Yes, thank you. Um, and I too want to say I hope you're feeling better, Dr. Smith, very soon. Um, uh, just two things that uh, on this same subject. One is I'm looking forward to seeing the contract as well and really appreciate that um, this has had some complexities to it. One point I want to raise is that when, at the time that we take this vote, I want to make sure we have a clear understanding of the disposition of the other buildings that are being currently utilized for these services. And this was a request that was made um, some, some time ago during a board meeting. And I, I would like to make sure that there's a deep understanding from, from the board of the implications of the action to the uh, buildings that are currently providing some of these services and what they may be used for in the future. Yeah, we, um, we've we done a uh, evaluation of both, uh, you know, Barbara Aronson Pavilion and Don Lowe currently for the public. Barbara Aronson Pavilion is our inpatient um, services for severely um, mentally disabled and um, Don Lowe is where we have our emergency psych facility. Both buildings are um, way past useful um, uh, time period to be operating um, and they have a rating that's 60% or more, meaning that in order to rehab them back to um, current standards and useful um, um, facilities, they would require at least 60% of full cost of rebuilding. So um, as I mentioned earlier, we're um, rethinking our and our master plan. And um, I will have, you know, we'll have a formal proposal in front of you, but just, you know, informally, I'm sure that we will not be able to recommend rehabbing them, but rather tearing them down and building on top of the space that currently exists because Barbara Aronson was built um, at a time period where the treatment for mentally ill was to pretty much lock them up. And so it's not set up well for either staff observation or healthy uh, treatment and training for um, um, patients and also Don Lowe was never really set up as a psych emergency. It was just co-opted as psych emergency. It doesn't have reasonable access and doesn't have all of the services that are needed. So 
Um, the plan at this point, I'm sure will boil down to um, moving as fast as we can with the new building. And as we can decant patients out of Barbara Aronson, um, tearing it down and rebuilding. And probably as the board has suggested in the past, the facility to replace Barbara Aronson would be a um, long-term care facility like an IMD um, and probably the same for uh, Don Lowe. But that's all, that's all not official yet until we get in front of you and ask for your opinion. And obviously your opinion decides what happens. And Dr. Dr. Smith, thank you for that. I, I think one of the, the reasons that, um, that I, and, and I know this is something that um, Supervisor Ellenberg has raised also, um, is that we recognize with the new um, psychiatric um, facility that it is an addition of teen beds, um, but doesn't expand the current service footprint for adults. And so I think that um, having some general direction about the other, the, the additional facilities, and, and in part because um, initially when this program, the programming for um, this facility came forward, it was not, it was additional resources, not um, replacement. And so I, as it relates to adults, so I want to make sure that that adult conversation happens robustly at the time of this contract, because once we, because I think that's going to be really important, uh, and perhaps this is maybe a, a better discussion for the CIP discussion overall, uh, but if I could just ask the staff to make sure that that discussion happens at both times so that the staff better understands the board's prioritization, but frankly, so the board better understands the staff's thinking as we're taking each of these steps would be very helpful. And it was good, Dr. Smith, just to hear your framework right now, because it's one that I, I concur with, but I agree with you that we, have, we obviously want the board to take some actions in those directions. Yeah, let me expand a little bit more. Um, you know, currently the inpatient utilization at BAP, I, the board knows, I don't know that the public knows, um, is filled with non-acute individuals because of the lack of placement facilities, IMDs and skilled nursing facilities in the community. And the numbers of individuals who actually meet the requirement for um, acute services is less than half of what's currently in there at the census. So when the new building is there, it should have sufficient size for the adults to care for all of the severely acute. And so therefore the plan is to try to get, um, you know, the right patient in the right service at the right time. And, you know, IMDs are going to be critical but we clearly are also watching for whether we need to expand um, inpatient beds. Um, there had been the discussion of redesigning this, you know, the uh, adult juvenile facility. That's not considered a viable alternative at this point because of the great desire to move as fast as we can. So, um, Hopefully that gives you some insight into what we're thinking. I, yeah, and that's really helpful. I would just say that on the acuity, um, the need relative to acuity, I I would love more information about the conclusions that you've just outlined, and they're not they're not um, they're not entirely my my reflection from both discussions with our staff and the public. Uh, that all said, I, I recognize that the other point you're raising is that that kind of analysis, um, robust analysis would be necessary for the next phase of development. I think that what I don't want to do is even if these current locations are are um, desperately in need of being re rebuilt, that we don't lose um, we don't lose placement options is what my real concern is because 
clearly from from living in San Jose and living downtown, I I can see the, the need pretty clearly, yeah. and so that's why the you know how we make that assessment is going to be really critical to determining um, future investments. So thank you for that. I guess I should probably explain a little bit about the acuity issue. When we say non-acute, what that means is we're utilizing Medi-Cal uh, standards for a de definition of inpatient acuity needs. And it, it's fairly complex. It means that, you know, they're needing medication and you identify also the symptomatology. And frankly, that's different than what a lay person or even a nurse or staff member might think of as acuity. Um, you know, people are on a wide range of functionality. We used to use a name called general um, activity, um, and which range from uh, one to a hundred, meaning that if you're normal, you had a hundred. If you were very abnormal, you were lower. And acuity used to be uh, measured as if you were under 60, you needed acute inpatient services. That's not utilized so much anymore, but um, the definition of acuity medically is different than what you and I might think of as acute. So we'll try to explain that in some extreme detail um, when we come back. Thank you very much. And I do appreciate that. Um... I, I do appreciate that your bigger point, and I think it's the takeaway here, is the appropriate placement for the for the appropriate for the person's need, right. and most irrespective of the categorization. So I, I do appreciate that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And before I recognize Supervisor Lee, I just want to apologize for that phone call. It was someone calling to um, inform me of their sidewalk office hours. All right, Supervisor Lee. Uh, thank you. I, I, this goes back to the questions uh, that, that we discussed, uh, Dr. Smith, regarding the uh, increasing of the adult beds, uh, as mentioned by Supervisor Chavez. Um, as we all know, there's been a delay, and we've been working really hard to get the adolescent slash adult uh, uh, mental health facilities built. And there's a discussion, basically, if you really want to increase bed very quickly, that side's already there, and if we increase the size of it, we could increase those back quickly. But I guess the question is, what type of delay are we talking about? Let's say we want to increase another floor of the building. You mean on the new building? Yeah. It's not even building. Um, we just knocked down the garage, uh, and we certainly are delayed building it because of all the contract issues we have. But if we change the scope and say, well, if we had another story and then more beds, that seems to be much faster than trying to add beds anywhere else. Well, mechanically, it would be months, but the problem is that we would have to go back to Ashbad or whatever they call themselves nowadays at the state level and get and go through the reapplication process and we'd have to renegotiate with another contractor. So it would end up being years of delay. I think uh, the um, if we need more beds, um, the better approach would be to convert some of our uh, medical beds at one of the three hospitals that we own to psychiatric beds, which would not be too difficult. And okay. we've particularly looked at um, O'Connor, which has uh, about 40 beds that could mm -hmm. be utilized for psychiatric patients. <clears throat> excuse me, um, because they have 20 um, in a unit that's long-term care mm -hmm. and 20 available in air, an area that used to be used for peds. Right. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, we're looking at all those options, but I think uh, redesigning the juvenile um, building is probably um, not a very good idea. It's basically too hard or to too long. Right. Okay. Thank you. And, right. and, and regarding the uh, conversion of those 40 beds in O'Connor and other uh, two other facilities, um, if you could uh, uh, let us know when you could get that uh, proposal back to us, we're certainly very excited to 
to hear about these proposals so that we can make it happen sooner than later. Yeah, staff's working on it right now. Great. Um, so we'll give you some update. Great, thank That's you. That's part of what we're modifying in our general plan, or not general plan, um, specific plan for the health services areas. Okay, thank you. Thank you and uh, hang in there, Dr. Smith. I think we've almost worn you out here. No, All right. I'm fine, I just still have a cough. <laughs> All right, so we're calling that as receiving report from our county executive board members. We have 11, which is a referral, 15 considering some recommendations, and 17 is received report only. And then our agenda is done. My suggestion would be that we just continue right through, uh, be done as soon as we're able to be done, and um, not break for lunch. Supervisor Smitty, and I see your thumbs up. Supervisor Chavez or Lee, thumbs up. There's three, there's four. Let's do it then. Go back to number uh, 11, Supervisor Lee, your referral, please. Yes, thank you uh, very much for, uh, for entertaining uh, this proposal, which I think is uh, something that is uh, uh, long overdue as well. Um, uh, first of all, I want to uh, acknowledge uh, the idea actually came from um, my uh, partner, uh, Mayor Larry Klein, uh, for coming up with this uh, proposal in order to make sure that uh, we have the cold weather shelter that is so uh, needed uh, in the in the winter months. Uh, as we know uh, that we do have some cold weather shelter right now for um, for uh, uh, individuals during the day. However, in the evening time, unfortunately, uh, that uh, might not be the case. And as we know that the, the seasons of the rain actually restarted uh, a week or so ago, we have some storm and rain, fairly mild uh, relative to what it could be, but certainly we expect that the weather to be uh, more uh, challenging uh, moving forward. So I think this referral is to try to uh, get ready for those times uh, and putting that uh, ahead so that we could get those uh, warming centers available. Uh, as we have seen, the number of uh, individuals dying in the streets who are unhoused uh, has been very dramatic already this year. Uh, and so I think this is also one of the reasons why we could also help save some lives uh, by having this uh, proposal move forward. Uh, what, this is, again, is a uh, joint uh, efforts by both uh, counties and cities. And I think that's something that we definitely need to explore. Thank you. Thank you. So Supervisor Lee, I assume that was your motion? That is my motion. Thank you. Thank you. I'll look for a second and I'll recognize a couple of members from the public. Second. Thank you, Supervisor Chavez. Nancy, would you please recognize the uh, two individuals from the public? Yes. First speaker is Blair Beekman. I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes. Hi, Blair Beekman. My hand was inadvertently raised, uh, but thank you for this item and uh, thank you for this item and good luck for your work. My hand was inadvertently raised. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you, Blair. Next speaker is Sean Cartwright. I am unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. It's still always good to hear from you, Blake. <clears throat> um, uh, Blair, sorry. Um, I just wanted to thank Supervisor Lee um, as one of the advocates who've been begging for an overnight uh, warming cooling center in Sunnyvale for years. We finally feel heard. So thank you very, very much. Um, I think at last count, 167 unhoused people have died on our streets so far. Um, the 167th person, um, I believe, was somebody that I know and is dear to me. So this is personal. Um, although they didn't die in Sunnyvale. Um, and um, it's just really overdue, long, long overdue. Um, so we really appreciate this and can't get this done soon enough. I do ask that it not, the uh, person who gets the contract, the company gets the contract, not be home first. Um, the reason that I say this is that the Sunnyvale shelter is switching to only allowing people to have 120 days stay. So you're going to be cycling people out after 120 days um, at Sunnyvale Shelter run by Home First, and then they're going to end up at the overnight warming center, cooling center run by Home First. 
it's kind of a little twisted um, from the people's perspective and it will keep people from actually going there because they just feel like they're being tormented by home first. Also on the MPOX, we are not getting enough outreach at Spring Street from the Office of LGBTQ Affairs. That is the gayest place in San Jose, Spring Street. And we really need an, more outreach there. Um, so if we could get that going from the county, that would be awesome. I've asked for it several times. Everyone seems to be like, we don't know what to do. So if we could do that, that'd be great. And I think we could increase MPOX vaccines. Um, that would be awesome. Thank you all. Hey, I still got seven seconds. I haven't lost my touch. Thanks, Sean. Thank you, and Nancy. And no speakers. Super. Nancy, roll call vote, please. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Yes. Thank you, Nancy. We now move on to item 15. Uh, it's the monthly report on the Valley Homeless Healthcare Program. And I'll look, there's Paul Lorenz. Mr. Lorenz. Hi. Hi, good afternoon, President Wasserman, uh, members of the board. Paul Lorenz, uh, Chief Executive Officer at the Valley Medical Center. Um, in the homeless report, there are two items I just wanted to point out. One is uh, a request for a, an appropriations modification for a Sprinter van. Uh, we receive grant funding, of course, and uh, that will help us conduct outreach efforts in the homeless encampments, et cetera. So, uh, that's a, a pretty important uh, acquisition for the program. Um, the other item is, of course, the project director evaluation for the HRSA program. Um, and as you well know, I serve as the project director. There is a, an evaluation in the package for your review. I do want to point out a couple of things that we're going to be focusing on in the coming year. One, of course, is really getting back to face-to-face -to -face encounters in outreach into the communities. Uh, so we can engage the homeless population at a greater degree uh, as we come out of COVID. So a lot of effort and focus will be in that area. Um, there is actually a referral uh, on this very issue around the re-entry uh, resource center and the Valley Homeless Program collaboration. Um, we will actually be reporting back it, uh, to your board, um, to the Health and Hospital Committee in, the, in this board regarding our efforts uh, in terms of coordination of services. And that is another area of focus for the coming year. Uh, and then the third thing, of course, is that we are gonna be focused on our quality metrics and really seek to improve upon those um, based on our quality improvement plan. Uh, so that will be the focus uh, of the coming year in addition to a, a number of other items. With that being said, I'm happy to respond to any specific questions that you may have. Thank you very much, CEO Lorenz, and oh, we supervise Chavez. Your hand. Yeah, thank you very much. And um, I want to just, and you may have touched on this, Paul, um, but Supervisor Ellenberg asked, and I asked for information about the hardest to treat clients who are ending up in EPS in the jail. And my staff had an opportunity to speak with your staff. And one of the points your staff made is that currently we're not tracking people who end up in EPS and who, or who, I'm sorry, who end up in, in custody. And given that I believe they're all using Epic in the, in custody, am I accurate about that? Is Epic being used in the jails now? That is correct. So what I would like to ask um, is two parts. One, I would like that report still to come back, but two, if there are challenges with how we track our clients, I, I would like to wrestle that to the ground because we should actually have, I mean, part of the reason we were so anxious to have Epic, I think, was so we could do this exact thing, which is track people more, more robustly and then help us use that data to make better decisions about how we address the particular needs of a client. Is that the report you were referring to, Paul? There are two parts to the referral supervisor, and I believe it actually came from you. And one is the coordination with reentry services um, around individuals with substance abuse issues and, the, and those individuals cycling through. Uh, the other one is uh, our relationship with EPS and custody and the reentry program. So what we will do is, uh, and staff did meet this morning and are preparing for a report back on both of those topics um, in terms of how we're managing and coordinating services for that population. That would be, if 
if um, possible, when that, when do you anticipate the report actually coming back? And I recognize, I recognize that we're still, you know, we're in the ever um, development around coordination, right? And so I, I'm recognizing that, but I am really interested in understanding when those might come back to us. So the initial report is uh, slated for the October um, board meeting. Um, right. And that is a report back as part of the this report here, the Valley Homeless Program report. Um, and as you point out, it's, it's an iterative process, so we'll provide you with the initial uh, programming and thoughts around services um, and the coordination that we'll be undertaking. And then um, more than likely, we will continue to report back to you on our progress. Well, what I what I would like to request is that the the reports not be bifurcated, and so when the report comes back to the full board in October, that we, even if it's two different departments um, responding, because I understand that your staff um, is working with um, reentry. Mm -hmm. um, we we just let's have one report, both staffs, so that we can start closing those gaps as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, was your direction part of a motion where yes. you also approved items A and B? Yes, sir. Thank you, President. It was. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Supervisor Lee, you want to second and make comments? Yes. Happy to second. And the comment is regarding uh, the purchasing of this print van. Uh, certainly, the, the delay is, is disconcerting. Uh, and, and having worked with the DHXP uh, doctors, clearly, this is one of the most urgent purchase we could do. Um, I guess my question here is, um, in addition, I mean, all we need is really one, in addition to our normal, pro, um, I guess, uh, supply uh, process, do you think there are ways we might be able to get this van through other uh, avenues so that we can get it sooner? Supervisor, I don't know the answer to that question, but that's something that we can follow up on. Yeah. Um, I do know it's a supply chain issue that resulted in the delay. Uh, but if there are other alternatives, I, I think it's fair to say that we should be exploring it. Right. Yeah. I mean, you're trying to buy five or 10. I can see you might need to go through the chain, but only one, I think, uh, some creative uh, way to find it without obviously following any rules uh, should should be doable, given the urgency of what this could be. So I just want to uh, throw that in to uh, open up our ideas to look out there, to look for this uh, need. All right. And that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have Supervisor Chavez's well-crafted motion, seconded by Supervisor Lee. Uh, we have one member of the public. Is that for this item, Nancy? Because we opened and closed that already, I believe. Yes, the hand uh, was raised just a few minutes ago. Okay, I'm going to assume that's in anticipation of the next item. Um, I'll ask for a roll call vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Yes. And apparently Coco's in favor too. With that, we're moving on to item number 17, which is our final item, the custody health services update on the proposed youth-led screening in Juvenile Hall and James Ranch. And um, Supervisor Lee, your hand is raised. I'll be happy to ask a quick question after the public comment. Okay, and Supervisor Chavez, do you wish to hear after the public as well? Yes. Thank you, Nancy, if you'll please recognize our public. Sure, one moment while we get the timer up. And Sean Cartwright, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Uh, to be clear, as soon as I saw uh, Paul's face on the last one, I raised my hand then. So, and then my hand got taken down and I raised my hand again. Oh, I'm sorry for that. Would you like to speak? Uh, yes, um, but I just wanted to let you know what happened. Um, VHHP, the uh, mobile health, um, the doctors, nurses, Sergio, all of them are fabulous. And so I think that's a really great thing. Can't say enough nice things, especially when uh, last winter, when it was brutal and we were getting personal phone calls like, hey, who are your worst people who needs to be seen the most and it was almost like they were making house calls mm -hmm. and really really appreciated those efforts um i mean literally just life-saving during that brutal winter um, really appreciate that 
still have lots of concerns because we still have unhoused people that are waiting like forever in the waiting room or being released uh, with uh, no clothes on or with um, hospital gowns on or whatever. There's definitely some issues with uh, what's happening in the ER there. Um, and then we just had somebody who is an advocate who spent forever there, uh, possibly having a heart attack. And then because they happened to fall asleep, the doctor woke them up poking them and saying, oh, I guess you're feeling better because yeah, you were sleeping. Wide ranging impacts. So, we'll pull that timer for one minute, if you would, Nancy, at 28 seconds for Sean. Thank you. Anybody that's uh, not speaking, if you could please turn your microphone off. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Sean. So we've had several issues and it just keeps happening and we're all keeping track. And so if we could have some sort of meeting about all those issues, because we're all like, I've got my stories and you've collected your stories and someone's collected their stories. If we could meet about that and address those issues, but I can't say enough good things about the mobile units and everything that they're doing, especially last winter. I mean, they really, really save some people's lives. Thank you. We are the best county in the nation. Thank you, Sean. We have another speaker, Nancy. Sorry about that. Blair Beekman, I'm unmuting you. Please accept the unmute. You have two minutes to speak. Hi, Blair Beekman here. Uh, thanks a lot for the words of Sean. Nice to hear her too. Uh, I, um, yeah, to speak uh, to a bit on, on, on the mobile issues, it's nice to hear that Sean uh, really likes their work and that's good to know. Um, I, you know, it's my feeling that in San Jose, they're, they're working a new set of statistical data to understand uh, homeless deaths that are happening because of road accident issues. And I felt this would be a time to just kind of bring up the issue that, um, you know, with the new concepts of equity, we're now counting homeless people as part of road statistics where you know we really didn't in the past we kept that kind of secretive and hidden and now they're being included in regular statistical data that is actually uh skewing previous data a bit making uh, uh death road death numbers in san jose look a bit larger than they have been in the past um you know, I, I want to acknowledge that we have to work on these road deaths issues as a part of Vision Zero, but I think we really need to acknowledge uh, the homeless deaths that are happening and why why is that happening? And I know Gail Osborne, who is a or, or Osmer, who is a person who spoke uh, earlier today, a public comment person about uh, the Columbus Park area. Um, she's really interested in working on these sort of issues. She's someone to talk to, and I thought it would just be a good reminder to, to really be concentrating on, on homeless deaths as road issues. Maybe the mobile unit can have a part in, in, in helping this uh, concept, and, and just for yourselves to be aware of it and the statistical ways to understand it. I, I think I'm explaining it right. It's an important uh, way to learn how to talk about these st the statistics. Uh, to be clear, and I hope I'm on the right track of how to talk about it clear. Thank you. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. I'll turn to Supervisor Chavez, then Supervisor Lee. You're muted, Supervisor Chavez. Thank you so much, President Wasserman. Yeah. Uh, colleagues, um, on April 19th, I put forward a motion supported by all of you directing Custody Health to make these lead screenings available um, by September. And it's been kind of a slow road to getting here. Um, and so rather than just asking a lot of questions, although I have some, I just want to request that a report come to the board at the first meeting in November with a work plan and a timeline for the approaches discussed in the ledge file for making lead screening available in the hall and the ranch. Thank you. And that would be my motion. That is your motion. I'll second. Thank you. Thank you. And Supervisor Chavez, did you have additional comments? No? Supervisor Lee, you seconded. Did you have comments? And then Supervisor- Yeah, just a, actually a quick question, uh, if there's no more public comment, and that is uh, trying to find out when uh, staff planned that this, uh, Blood level, uh, blood lead level screening uh, will start for our juvenile justice involved youth in the county at this point. Is there any uh, start date that they're expecting? 
All right, and you just heard the, the uh, motion. Uh, oh, we've got Eureka Day on, wonderful. Thank you, Director. Do you wish to respond, please? Uh, yes, and if I may. And good afternoon, Supervisor Wasserman and board members. And this is Jerika Day, Director of Custody Health Services. And I am back in front of you to give a more detailed report. However, a motion has been put forward. But I do want to qualify that over the past quarter, Custody Health Services has participated in several different meetings to do the due diligence to inform the integrity of the request, as well as receiving consultation and meeting with other stakeholders and partners in the community, uh, with the pediatric groups and the academic Academic pediatric groups, the California Public Health on Childhood Lead Poisoning and Prevention, as well as the Santa Clara County Public Health Department. And also, we conducted a thorough review of the literature to inform the process. We also reviewed the Childhood Lead Poisoning Prevention Branch requirements under Title 17, Division 1, Chapter 9, on screening for childhood lead poisoning, particularly when screening asymptomatic youth and their blood levels, as well as the standards of care required, up to including uh, provisions for healthcare providers disciplinary who do not follow the standards. And so we are confident that we've done the work and we can put together a comprehensive program for blood lead level interventions, uh, also including having to follow the regulatory as well as our processes for putting forward policies and procedures to vet those through the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee to also go through the training that's required for nursing staff, which is a 30-day window, as well as having a meeting discussed with RMPA. We also need to build a custom um, health build in the record to track the data as well as to have uh, the portal uh, to document the screenings as we move forward, as well as making sure that we have the resources in place, particularly if we need to consult with family members and or other providers and partners in the community, if indeed we do come up with patients who screen positive for blood level. And so those are the works that we've been doing and uh, putting together those processes, but also to follow the process to that these into policies, procedures, training, uh, meet and discuss with our RMPA members, as well as rolling it out with consents and resource information to provide to the family members. Thank you for that excellent report. Sounds like you'll have a lot of good news to report back on the first meeting in November per Supervisor Chavez's motion. Supervisor Lee, you seconded the motion, asked a question. Did you have another? Yeah, I do have one quick one uh, on the um, report. Uh, there's a table just presented uh, from the PRB and the kids data showing the number as a whole on the breakdown uh, numbers. Uh, the question is, is, do we have any further breakdown as to location like by zip code where these children are located? Is there such a fidelity or data that we could be uh, provided? And Supervisor, I think you're referring to the kids' data, the Population right. Reference Bureau. And yeah. that data actually from 2018 did not break down any further per zip code area. However, mm -hmm. I did find more current data from 2020. And actually, the percentage of uh, uh, screenings for children in the Santa Clara County have improved significantly. What I did find, however, was from the CDPH, and this was data, it's outdated, it's from 2012, and it did break down by the 20 uh, zip codes in Santa Clara County, the results of children who either had uh, greater than 4.5 milligrams of blood, excuse me, of lead, point, lead levels in their blood. And so that's outdated. However, that was the only current uh, information that I can find on zip code areas in the Santa Clara County. Thank you. Thank you. That's all the questions I have. Thank you very much. Supervisor Simidian. I just uh, I uh, look forward to voting for the motion in a moment. I just wanted to um, say three words, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, privacy, juveniles, HIPAA. And I just want to make sure that as folks go forward with this effort, they are mindful of privacy considerations, uh, they're uh, mindful of the uh, particular status of juveniles with respect to consent, and uh, they're mindful of uh, the HIPAA requirements, which I know Dr. Day is uh, living with 24-7. So thank you yes, for that. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Yes, she is. Thank you. And before we take a Supervisor Chavez, your hand. Yes, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Day, for that, that um, robust set of information about how many how, how many layers and levels of partners that you need to work with on something like this. Um, one request that I would like to make is that 
I, I'm very interested in understanding how the research that we did for uh, the impacts of Reed Hill View Airport, that study folds into the information that you're um, able to gather. And there, there are kind of two big reasons that I'm interested in it. One is uh, because that's such an intensive look at um, blood lead levels for children, you know, and I, I don't know how many zip codes that encompasses, but certainly narrowing it down to the census tracts, which is what the staff was able to do, I think would be extremely informative. And then the second, which I don't, Dr. Day, this isn't something that I would ask of you, but something I would be asking through the, the um, county exec's office, is the work that's being done um, on behalf of the county to in, um, inform the EPA about the changes we're interested in looking at relative to when um, a child is considered to have um, blood lead level poisoning. Because what's interesting about the framework we're using is we're using the EPA's then therefore the state of California's framework, but we know that blood lead level poisoning happens at such a minute level that in some ways the, the data framework we're using here um, ignores what we know about science. And, I, and I'm not putting that on Dr. Day. I think that we don't have a choice, but that's the way that we're obligated to approach it based on the rules of the state of California, but based on the research we've done ourselves, we know that there's a much a lower level of, of, of poisoning that causes permanent brain damage. So um, when the final report comes back to us, I'd be interested in understanding, again, from the, from the county exec's side of the aisle, what, what the implications of that are for what is discovered through Dr. Day's work. Maybe I can uh, jump in and try to answer those excellent questions. Um, the difference between um, doing a survey you know, of the juveniles in detention and what happened with the air monitoring is that um, the information collected with regard to air monitoring was all de-identified um, at the state level. So it was really just a statistical analysis of age and <clears throat> level of uh, lead um, and correlating that with the proximity to the airport. Um, so all of the approvals and discussions and policies that uh, Dr. Day um, talked about were not applicable. Um, because we can't really de-identify um, significantly the um, sampling from custody, uh, we have all these hoops to jump through in terms of confidentiality, HIPAA, and all of the analysis that Dr. Day mentioned. Um, so the two are going to be significantly different viewpoints of the same problem, but I think they're critically important. So um, that's why it's been a little bit of a struggle to get all of everything in place to be able to actually do it um, at custody. In terms of the issue of whether the um, measurement of detrimental effects should be lower, um, I probably should turn that over to James because in our complaint, um, we addressed a request for the EPA to look at that. And I'm not quite sure where that is yet. Um, so maybe James can talk about that. Mr. Williams. So with, re with respect to the EPA um, rulemaking on um, leaded avgas, we're still awaiting an endangerment finding from the EPA. Um, the EPA indicated they're moving forward with that process. It's unfortunately a very slow regulatory process. And so it's going to take many, many years to get where we need to get uh, at the federal level on that process. And that's one of the reasons why, as the board is aware, we're taking so many actions locally 
to take some immediate steps, even while that proceeds. It's obviously a very important process, but uh, first there has to be an endangerment finding formally by the EPA and then uh, further rulemaking proceedings that will take uh, a number of years. Just as a follow-up uh, on the endangerment finding, the endangerment finding, um, while it's focused on avgas, it also has the capacity to reconsider what is considered lead poisoning. Isn't that is that accurate about the current process? Uh, it, that certainly could be pieces within the scope. I think the EPA's focus right now really is on the the specific issue of leaded avgas. Um, you know, the EPA has already taken a number of positions that there's no safe level of lead. Um, and so, you know, the, the, this rulemaking will piggyback, so to speak, on those prior EPA decisions. Thank you. Supervisor Smidian, your hand is down. We are all, we are all there. Report received. Motion was made and by Supervisor Chavez, seconded by Supervisor Lee. Do I have that correct? Thank you. And we'll call for a vote. Supervisor Lee? Aye. Supervisor Chavez? Yes. Supervisor Simidian? Aye. President Wasserman? Aye as well. Thank you very much. Board members, if there's no objection, that concludes our agenda for this board meeting. And I will adjourn this meeting to our next meeting, which will be October 4th, I believe. Nancy, is that what you have? Yes, that is correct. Super. Tuesday, October 4th at 9.30. Thank you all very much. Take care. Be safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. With that, this meeting room will now be closed. Thank you all for attending and have a great day.